Welcome to the Weed Biocontrol Summit in 2020. We would want to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous people of this continent and recognize that we are sitting on an ancestral and unceded territory. My name is Jennifer Andres. I'm with Washington State University and I'm the director of the Integrated Weed Control Project. My name is Carrie Brown Lima and I'm the director of the New York Invasive Species Research Institute, which is based at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. We are the co-chairs of the Naisma Biocontrol Committee, which is the host of this summit. We would like to thank everyone who helped pull the summit together. This summit is sponsored by the Bureau of Land Management, Wyoming Weed and Pest Council, and Naisma members and partners. Our support allowed this to be a free event open to the public. We're pretty excited. We have 570 people registered for the for this summit, which is um, really fantastic interest in the topic. As you can see on this slide, this is our Naisma Biocontrol Committee. If you are interested in joining that committee, you're welcome to, and you just need to be a Naisma member to do so. Just a real quick word for those of you that are coming into this without knowing much about what Naisma is. It's a North American Invasive Species Management Association, and it has a mission to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. So this event, sharing information on biocontrol, Possible Biocontrol Weeds is a outreach opportunity for NASMA to share information with all of you. If you want to join NASMA, you go to the website and join. There's different levels of membership and you can see which one fits you, but it's a great way to get involved, to be able to have access to all of the resources that NASMA provides that you can see on the website, and also to join committees like uh, coordinating the summit. Bell Bergner, the executive director, asked me to point out we just wrapped up the 2020 conference, which was virtual due, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but if you missed it, that's the great thing about it being virtual was that it was all recorded and for a reduced fee, you can have access to all the presentations. So there's still a chance to go back and, and take a look at all the great information that was shared there with the advance. And also it included a Biocontrol 101 workshop and other biocontrol sessions. They asked us to remind you all that the next conference will hopefully be in person, which is a great opportunity to meet other folks dealing with invasive species throughout North America. And that will be in Missoula, Montana, September 27th through 30th, 2021. So keep an eye out for that and save the date. So I just wanted to let you know, usually what you're gonna see today is a summit. And usually this is actually part of the conference. And so the, it would be tacked on usually at the end of the conference, but because of this uh, virtual world we're living in right now, we're doing it virtually, which is a great opportunity to bring in speakers from all across North America and Europe that normally might not even be able to attend in person. Although we have a lot of updates, these are actually, we don't even consider this a comprehensive list, so we apologize if there's anyone out there that wish they had a chance to share their update, but uh, weren't aware of it or, or aren't on the agenda please reach out to us so we can make sure we keep you in the loop for, for upcoming opportunities. Um, and we also really, like, the purpose of this is to share information, but we really want to strengthen the biocontrol community throughout North America and have these opportunities to bring all of our work together. So this is our agenda today. It's pretty tight. As you can see, we have a lot of really awesome speakers. This agenda is available online for you to look at more in depth. We will move straight into our European update where we will have um, both CABI and BBCA uh, providing presentations on all of their good work. My name is Harriet Tins and I'm leading the CABI operation in Switzerland and the Americas and we'll give you an overview of our activities for the US and Canada. On the picture, you see our building in Switzerland on the right. It's a two-story building, including a quarantine, four quarantine rooms, not only for weed biocontrol, but also our support biocontrol agents that we source from Asia. Then adjacent to that, several greenhouses to grow our uh, test plants and target weeds. In the middle, garden beds for the same purpose. And on the left, uh, quite a large garden space to conduct experiments and open field tests. Before I started on weed biocontrol, let me say a few words about CABI. We were founded in 1910 as a purely UK-based organization. We became international in 1988. We are also not-for-profit and intergovernmental. 
our 50 member countries basically OCABI and they have an equal role in our governance and can also direct our strategic direction. We have about 480 staff worldwide. CABI is mainly working for the developing world. So we in Switzerland are a little bit uh, different in that over half of our work is for the developed world. CABI deals with global issues such as food security and food safety. We are also a major publisher of scientific information. Maybe you've come across the CAP abstracts or our books, ebooks, or compendia. For instance, there is an invasive species compendia freely available on the internet. These are our member countries. Canada is a very long standing active member country. The US is unfortunately not a member at, the, at this point in time. Switzerland joined in the year 2000. This is, our, this is not our complete global reach, uh, but only our 11 research centers, which are mostly located in Asia and uh, Africa, also with two centers, one in the UK and Switzerland in Europe, and two small operations in Latin America. I now come directly to the WEEDS team at CABI Switzerland. I'm still responsible leading the uh, mostly organizing the finances and uh, overall organization of projects. But the main work is really done by our five research scientists, Patrick, Shislen, Sonia, Philip, and Ivo Tosevsky, uh, located in Serbia. We have two garden technicians, Florence and Quentin, and one permanent technical assistant, Cornelia Kloska. Apart from that, we work a lot with temporary summer students, uh, interns. This year, we obviously have had to reduce their number quite a bit, and we're not able um, to welcome any North American uh, students. For them, it's really also a great opportunity to see how uh, the weeds are growing in the native range, and they usually come for uh, a couple of months to help with the practical work, for instance, between their bachelor and master degree. Our WEEDS team in the UK is slightly larger. They have 13 uh, scientists led by Marion Sayer. Uh, on the top row, these are all pathologists. So our uh, pathology expertise really lies in the UK center. In the middle row, uh, these are entomologists. And then they also have a, a socioeconomist, two modelers and a, a garden technician. And they also uh, have about two interns per year. A uh, few words to our funding. Uh, so this is the funding for the UK and the Swiss team from North America in 2020, uh, about 940,000 uh, US dollars. About two thirds of that comes from the, the, the US. So that's the red and the blue pies, uh, then 28% from Canada, that's the green pies, and about 5% from Australia. Our five main donors, which would be USDA, APHIS, the Army Corps, the two states, Montana, Wyoming, and British Columbia, made up in 2020 over 80% of our funding. Now, most of the 20 projects that we currently work on are funded by a so-called consortium approach. That means that several entities with the same weak problem get together with the advantage that each entity does not have to invest too much. And our advantage is that the uh, financial um, yeah, uh, risk is, is reduced. These uh, different uh, projects are in, in different states. So in different stages, we have, for instance, very old projects like Houndstongue or Toadflex that have been ongoing for, for many years, where we only rare agents ship them to North America and help preparing petitions. Now, only doesn't mean that it's not a very important part of our work, especially developing effective rearing protocols is very important if you then want to rear the agent in quarantine in North America and have a sufficient number of specimens available for release. We then have projects that, let's say, they're in full swing, such as flowering rush, oxide daisy, or common tansy. And then projects that we just started on, like Tree of Heaven, that Francesca will uh, talk about in a moment, and or Parrot's Feather, where we do feasibility study for British Columbia. 
Overall, we work on about 45 different agents on these 20 projects. And just to mention, our UK Centre also conducts two projects for Hawaii on wild ginger and blackberry. On five of these projects, we collaborate, so the ones in green with BBCA in Italy, and especially on, on swallow boards, we also collaborate with the USD ARS lab in uh, southern France. In red, you see here the, the cabby centers, so one in the UK, Switzerland, then we have one center in Pakistan. They also used to be quite active in wheat biocontrol exploration in the 70s. And we have also a center in Beijing. It's a little bit off the story, but then the blue star is the USD ARS lab. The green star in Italy is BBCA. And we have lots of other collaborators in, in the countries that we go to, not only to facilitate field surveys, collect insects, but also more and more to help us acquire the necessary permits to export living organisms uh, from their countries. By the way, on the bottom, that's Francesca from BBCA and to the left, Massimo Cristofaro leading the BBCA operation in Italy. Kebi has 60 years of experience in classical wheat biocontrol. Basically, we started with agents for uh, thistles, Canada thistle, nodding thistle. Then there were the, the leafy spurt insects, toad flex. So a lot of these insects that have been successfully released against leafy spurt, toad flex, knapweeds, percolose, thrive, and others were researched and developed by Kebi. In total, 47 agents were released based on our work, which consists obviously of the yeah, foreign exploration, finding insects, mites, and fungal pathogens. But then our main work is obviously to determine the environmental safety of the agents, quantify their impact, develop wearing protocols. I already mentioned how important that is. Ship the agents to North America, which has, for obvious reasons, become quite difficult in recent times and quite expensive. Our end product is our petitions for field release to submit together with our North American collaborators petition for field release and obviously eventually to release the agent. This is then not in our hands, of course. So in the next slides, I will uh, concentrate on these end products. Let me start with a recent release in the US of gold forming weevil Venusa pilosa on yellow toad flex. A joint petition has been submitted um, by Rosemary de Clerc Float from Agriculture Agri Food Canada and Charlene Singh from the US Forest Service in Montana at the Rocky Mountain Research Station in 2012. TAG recommended release in 2013. Canada made first releases in 2014, and I believe that Rose uh, in her talk will give you more detail on that. In the US, the release permit was issued in 2018 and Charlene, together with David Weaver from MSU, was able to conduct first releases in 2019. This year, she was able to rear close to 5,000 pilos based on a shipment of 1,000 insects that we sent her this spring. And uh, she continued releases, but obviously these were limited to Montana to COVID-19. Kylosia urbana is a root feeding hoverfly on hawkweeds, mostly uh, meadow hawkweed and orange hawkweed, but not only. So it's less restricted in, its, in the hawkweed species it detects uh, than the, the gold wasp that was released a couple of years ago. Again, a joint petition by Rose uh, in Canada and Jeff Littlefield at MSU in 2015. It's the same pattern you see take recommended release in 2016, Canada released in 2017. As you can see, Canada is usually faster to release the insects. That's why we also take advantage of joint petitions. Of course, it needs to make sense that the weed is really also a problem in Canada and in the US. In the US, the insect has to go uh, through several additional uh, hurdles. An environmental assessment needs to be prepared. It needs to go through a seventh consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service, through tribal consultation, public uh, comment. So that's why in the US uh, things uh, usually take a bit longer. Uh, releases were foreseen for 2020, but again, uh, they had to be postponed to COVID-19. 
we collect and ship apples and eggs. Uh, in this case, the insect cannot be reared under confined conditions. That's also, that also happens. Females readily lay eggs in um, confinement, but we cannot get the insect to mate. So what you have to do is to collect rabbit fertilized females in the field, which as you can imagine is not obvious. So when Gislin, the project scientist, manages to send uh, 10 rabbit females to rows, we are already very happy. There have been uh, two Aranara moths, two shoot mining noctuid moths on common reed that we worked on. We determined that they can develop on the native reed, uh, but females highly prefer invasive reed for egg laying and eggs survive less well on native reed. Based on that tag, we commended release in April 2019 and shortly after Rob Boucher, uh, also from Agriculture Agri-Food Canada, was able to release them in field cages in Ontario. Again, Cabby is maintaining a rearing and uh, shipping eggs. Patrick, the project scientist, was able to rear, in fact, uh, 11,000 eggs of one of the, the two species. And uh, there is also trials ongoing rare these insects on artificial diet to make the rearing even more effective. The other counterpart in the US is uh, Bernd Blossai from Cornell University. And uh, yeah, we're still waiting for the release in, in the US. Suturingus curricollis is a root mining weevil on garlic mustard. And the story here is a little bit longer. Maybe first to mention that the larvae are highly destructive. They can kill overwintering rosettes and this insect has been uh, predicted uh, based on the model uh, to be really the most successful agent on, on garlic mustard. It was first petitioned in 2008. After several resubmissions, a take finally recommended release in February 2017. First release occurred in Ontario by Rob Boucher in 2018. And we actually just uh, two days ago uh, saw very nice pictures that indicate that the insect uh, most probably established in Canada. And I'm sure Rob will talk more about that. Again, we are waiting for the approval for the US. Avalara itadori is an insect, a sap-sucking psyllid on knotweeds that our UK centre worked on uh, actually for Europe. Knotweeds come from Japan and are not only invasive in North America but also in Europe. So in the UK this insect was already released in, in 2010. First releases in Canada happened in 2015. It did successfully overwinter and produces multiple generation in summer, but there's no outbreak densities yet. And a lot of research has gone um, into find, trying to pin down the factors that, that limit the population buildup of this insect. Our, the scientists from our UK center collected a new population, hopefully better climatically adapted and more aggressive in 2019 and Fritzi Griefstedt from Oregon State University who on the picture on the right was able to release 34,000 in June this year at 27 sites in eight states in the east and western US. As she, she wrote that at least at five sites psyllids were seen over summer. Uh, the insect is very small so it's, uh, it's quite hard to uh, find it back in a large. We um, have also been working on an aerophyte mite on Russian olive which reduces seed output. We concentrated on specifically on agents reducing seed output, not killing uh, trees in order to avoid any conflict of interest with the people that still value Russian olive as a tree. We did this work in collaboration with scientists in Italy, Turkey and Serbia. Again, a joint petition was submitted, this time by Tim Collier from the University of Wyoming and, and Rose. Tag recommended release in May 2020. But then, uh, strangely enough, the, um, the Canadian Food in Inspection Agency, which is the pendant to uh, APHIS PPQ, so the, uh, the, the permitting entity in Canada, did not approve release, not because of environmental, not because of post specificity concerns, but because they felt that we don't have enough quantitative data on the impact of the mite. 
So that was quite unusual. There were also some comments to be addressed from the US side. So all of these comments are currently being considered to further go through the permitting process. Then again, a, a bit of a longer story, the gold forming Vivo Suturinkis Cardaria on Hori Crest was also first petitioned in 2011, where TAG requested additional tests that we, we did. And in conclusion, we found that this insect has a relatively broad physiological host range, so in tests under no choice conditions, but uh, likely a very narrow ecological host range, so under more natural conditions. Based on that, a petition was resubmitted in collaboration with Mark Schwarzländer from the University of Idaho in January 2020. In August, we received a TAG response that said that at this point in time, TAG cannot uh, recommend the release of this agent without reservations. Uh, so basically, there are reservations to release it that need to be addressed, and we will uh, we will reach out to TAG and the APSPPQ to hopefully find a way forward for this very uh, damaging insect on our request. Mogulonus boreginus is a seed feeding weevil on hound's tongue. Uh, this one is very specific, so the specificity shouldn't be a problem. Both adult and larval feeding reduce seed output and it we do know that hound's tongue is seed limited so the insect should have an impact on the population of hound's tongue again mark we or we submitted a petition together with mark very recently at the end of september so obviously we have no uh, reaction yet and just to mention a petition for mogulus crucifer a root mining weevil on hound's tongue which is already established uh, successfully in canada will follow shortly Several petitions, at least five, are in preparation. Again, you see a lot of the weevils are uh, a very uh, diverse, large uh, group within the, uh, the beetle fam order, and a, a lot of them have been shown to be very successful, overproportionally uh, successful control agents. We have a leaf and rhizome feeding weevil on flowering brush, a seed feeding weevil on garlic mustard, another seed feeding weevil on dyer's woad, a root mining moth on oxide daisy and a gold forming weevil on Dalmatian toad flex. So I'm estimating that everything goes as planned, all of these should be submitted during 2021. Then I would like to take the opportunity to just make some publicity for one of our projects that is that could really profit from additional consortium partners. It, this project, Field Bindweed, is currently only funded by USDA APHIS. Uh, the current consortium chair is John Gaskin. We do have two very promising insects, one uh, an agrimycid fly the larvae of which mine in the shoot and root crown, uh, which occurs at highly disturbed sites. So that could really be advantages to establish the insect in more agricultural settings. And a root boring sessiid moth. The larvae are super destructive. They can kill plants. Uh, in fact, Ivo, who works with this insect in Serbia, had um, problems to, 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 to get the rearing going because the larvae were uh, killing the plants prematurely. So in case you're interested in this uh, project, please, please let us know. Potential future targets. We are currently in discussion to, to try and join the, the uh, cheatgrass initiative that BBCA and USDARS are already working on. We have been discussing with Ray Calloway and Jacob Lucero from the University of Montana to submit a proposal for biogeographic study, not emphasizing biocontrol, but more to elucidate the invasion mechanism of this very highly invasive grass. As I already mentioned, we, we are currently conducting a feasibility study on parrot's feather for British Columbia, so we will see uh, whether that continues. And we have also been talking years back about a potential project on blue weed. At the time, we did not start a project because of potential conflict of interest with beekeepers that highly value this plant. This situation might change. 
if you're interested, if you have an, an, a new invasive species for which no biocontrol effort exists yet, feel free to send me an email and we can do a quick feasibility study or at least give you our opinion, let's say it like that, whether this could be a good potential target for biocontrol or rather not. Finally, let me say something about reporting. We produce a progress report in August each year that I send around as a PDF to a distribution list. If you're not on the distribution list, if you like to receive this report, let me know. Basically, we summarize the results of the current year of all of the projects we actively work on. And we also produce at the beginning of each year a detailed project annual reports. These are not available on our website. So you would need to, because they do contain a lot of unpublished data, uh, but if you email us, we are happy to share. And uh, yeah, you see also our website. There is also information about all of our projects. And I've started to send around news emails uh, with more general information about CAPI. Good morning, everyone. I'm Francesca Marini from BBCA. We are a, a private foundation which work about biological control since the beginning of thousand. We are a small uh, group of people based in Rome uh, in a private land where we office a laboratory, a small greenhouse and uh, space enough for performing uh, uh, field garden experiments. Here you can have an idea of uh, which is our uh, annual budget and uh, how it's uh, easily to understand most of the funds are used for salaries, but the second uh, largest item are the traveling expenses. Most of our funds come from USDA, ERC, BCL, and the rest is covered by many different donors, mainly from, from US. Unfortunately, during the last uh, three years, we are having contraction of the budget, which, however, don't, doesn't correspond to a reduction of the number of the project. In fact, just speaking about wheat without mention uh, pest, uh, we manage something like more or less 20 projects uh, for which we perform uh, different activities. You are probably wondering uh, how such a small group of people can manage this amount of work. And uh, this is possible just because we uh, used to work as a network. In fact, we cooperate with many different uh, centers of research almost all around in the world in the US, many in Europe, Asia, Africa, and so this network allows us to, to be able to manage this amount of, of projects. For today, I would like to give you an update just about three weeks, because of course I cannot speak about all of them, and, but I selected them with, with the idea to give you also to share with you how we work about uh, biological control, because in fact, all three targets at the moment are at a different stage in the process of, in the long process of the uh, selection of a biological control agents. Starting with the cheek grass, uh, we work on this project uh, together with the uh, University of Belgrade, USDA, USDA ARS Nevada, USDA ARS EBCL. And as uh, Ariat just mentioned, we are starting a, a cooperation with CABI as well, that has been recently contacted by two donors from Wyoming and British Columbia, which are interested in the uh, possibility to use a biological control approach against the uh, cheek grass. Starting from the beginning of the process, during the last years, we collected many samples of different population of cheatgrass in the old and the new world. This gives us a, a huge amount of, of samples of material, thanks to which we started an extensive molecular analysis, and we almost complete the genome sequences and the genetic study comparing the old world and new world cheatgrass population. In this way, we will have the background to try to study the invasion mechanism of cheatgrass. So, as Harriet mentioned, in cooperation with Ray Callaway and Jacopo Lucero from University of Montana, we are in the process of preparing a, a proposal about it. Our idea is to perform a biogeographic study comparing the native and then introduced range in order to figure out how this weed should be managed 
and which role the biocontrol could have. The main goal is to identify the driving factor of cheatgrass invasion in North America and figure out if the top-down pressure from the biological control could potentially control these weeds. Regarding the option of the biological control on cheatgrass, at the moment we have in our hand three interesting candidates, an aerophyte mite, a midge and a weevil. Regarding aerophyte mite, we, we found them on cheatgrass many times in different countries, Kazakhstan, Turkey, but we always found olifagus species. But thankfully, we didn't give up. And in 2017, we recorded uh, a new species on uh, cheatgrass. We found two populations, one in Bulgaria and one in Serbia, near Belgrade. What is interesting is that in the site uh, in Bulgaria, both cheatgrass and medusa head occur at the same site. But on each of them, we found uh, two different uh, species of mites. Uh, what I mean is that the new species uh, looks similar from the morphological point of view to Aculodes, um, another area of it mite that we are currently evaluating as a biological control agents uh, of Medusa head. But our new species on, on cheatgrass is genetically different from uh, these mites. And even if the two weeds occur at the same site, we never find found on cheatgrass and this new aerophic mite species on medusa head. In our opinion, it is a good indication that this new species of aerophic mite could be uh, really specific for, for cheatgrass. Regarding the niche, also in this case, is a new species. We recorded uh, three populations in Greece and one in Bulgaria. Most probably is a, a stenodiplosis species and this genus usually is associated only to grass species. According to what is known about a cogene that attacked the larvae of this genus attack the flowers and then they grow into prepupi or pupi which conclude the development inside of the seeds. So this could be a good indication of the potential impact that this niche could have on, on cheese grass. We are really at the beginning. We uh, just found uh, for the first time last year at the same site in Greece where also the midge is present uh, and we are currently trying to identify which is the species. It could be a Justapion species but we are really at the beginning uh, so I cannot say anything more. Next step will be for sure the description of the two new species and the identification of the weevil. Since almost nothing is known about these three candidates, we will probably start from the evaluation of the impact that they can have on cheatgrass. In the meanwhile, we will submit the proposal regarding the invasion mechanism of cheatgrass and we are also preparing the list of the non-target species which should be considered in the evaluation of the host range for these three potential candidates. Changing subject and moving on Trio Heaven, also in this case is a teamwork. We work together with CAVI, University of Bari and Belgrade and USDA Arts EBCL in France. We are working almost five years on that we recorded for the first time in Europe in 2015 in a site just near the lab here in Rome. And uh, a couple of years later, we performed a survey uh, in Europe and we realized that actually the mite uh, is quite widespread. Last record is from this year when EBCL found uh, a population in Paris, for example. Thanks to field observation, we realized that the impact that, that uh, this mite can have on Trio Heaven is quite impressive. Here you have some picture that can give you an idea of the uh, shape of the leaves completely deformed or how the, the mite can uh, practically killing the apical part of the new uh, sprouts. On the base uh, of this, this preliminary observation, last summer we decided to perform some preliminary impact tests working on potted plants which we cut the ground level uh, in order to induce the plant to produce the new sprout, which usually come from the roots or from what's the remaining of the tree trunk. We inoculate uh, 15 one five mites on some of the new sprouts and then we follow 
test inoculated the sprout and uninoculated during their grow. And uh, this is what we have seen just one month later. As you can see, the shape of the leaves of inoculated plants is completely deformed. And after two months, the leaves are quickly going to become dry and, and then die. In the meanwhile, we are also uh, evaluating the host range of this area of it might, and so far we performed two open field tests, testing eight and six species closely related to Trio Heaven. They have been selected for their economical value and um, because maybe they are ecologically close to Trio Heaven and maybe they share uh, the same. The experiments that we performed this year ended at the beginning of September, but unfortunately due to the COVID situation, we couldn't provide the material to the specialists, so we don't have the final results yet. But as far as we could see, the results are consistent with what we, we obtained the year before. And uh, in particular, uh, in 2019, after 30 uh, days post inoculation, we recorded the presence of few mites on uh, some non target species. But we collected, I have to specify that we collected just 29 mites, despite of having infested 15 mites on each plant and only five of them were alive and there were two on one and three on Holmok. While on Trio Heaven the number of aerophyte uh, mites was already almost 10,000. Just 10 days later, we collected only three mites on uh, walnut tree and Holmok, but all of them were dead. While on Trio Heaven the number of aerophyte mites was uh, almost the double of the 10 days before. After 50 days post-inoculation, we didn't find Aculus mosoniensis on the non-target species. So this means that what we inoculated on the plant at the beginning was, was left or dead. But on Trio Heaven, we got a really huge infestation. You can have imaging from these photos. And we realized that the 90% of the mites collected on Trio Heaven during the experiment were alive. And we also observed that the number of female increased during the season, while the number of male decreased. This is the typical path for the rheophyte mite, uh, where uh, the, the female is usually the sex that goes to overwintering. Regarding the impact, we didn't record any, any symptoms of the presence of the rheophyte mite on the non-target species. But here you have an idea of what we have seen on Trio Heaven. So we recorded the first symptoms uh, in only 10 days uh, and uh, after one month the plants start to lose the leaflets. After 50 days the, most of the leaves were completely gone and the apical part was going to die. And this is what remaining after uh, more than two months. So our plan is to expand the list of the non-target species to test, especially because some stakeholders and donors from US and, and Canada show their interest. So at the moment there are US species growing at the EBCL facility and CABI is preparing the list of the species interesting for Canada. We also plan to increase our knowledge regarding the biology of these rheophyte mites in order to increase the possibility of success of potential release of these agents. And we are also taking in consideration the possibility to include the mite in an integrated manage approach. Our idea is to, to do something similar about, of what I explained to you of, uh, regarding the preliminary impact test. So our idea is to cut back the large tree and uh, inoculate the mite on the resprouting plants and see if they are able to keep in control the new sprouts. Last but not least is a Russian Tistel, a project in cooperation with the University of Bari and Belgrade because also in this case I'm presenting you data about mite. USDA HARS California, USDA HARS EBCL in France. We work on uh, this area of it might since more than 20 years. Uh, so the, the might was discovered in 1996 and we evaluate the impact that the might can have on the plant in laboratory and on uh, 
uh, field condition. And we recorded a reduction of the 60% of the size of the plants in controlled condition, but this is even more stronger in field condition where the reduction reached the 80%. In general, infested plants remaining stunted and less spiny, and also the seed production is drastically reduced. We also evaluate the fundamental host range of uh, this area of it might. And thanks the, to this experiment in laboratory condition, we had a confirmation that Aceres salsola is highly specific, specific for uh, Russian teasel. But we also discovered that it can sometimes persist on some non-target species. So for this reason, we move into a, an evaluation of the ecological host range in order to verify if, if the fundamental of host range was a, an overestimation of the real host range of the area of it might. And, and in fact, we recorded that the non-target species are, are not suitable for a serious salsola in the field as in laboratory condition. But in any case, few might have been found on some non-target species, even if they didn't build up a population on them. And, and for this reason, we set up another open field test where we inoculate a rheophyte mite on, on the plant at the seedling stage and we run the experiment for the whole season, giving the possibility to the plant to reach uh, the mature stage. In order to have the possibility to eventually evaluate the, the potential impact of the mite on the critical non-target species, we set up also a field plot where we locate the non-target species on which we in not inoculate any mite. At the end of the experiment, we found uh, Aceria salsole only on one non-target species, uh, Atripex coronata. But I have to say that we collected uh, just uh, 18 mites in total, uh, which only six were uh, alive. And we didn't record uh, any juveniles uh, from uh, coronata, even among the dead specimens. While on Russian Tistel, we collected a thousand uh, of mites, juveniles, males uh, and females. So this means that what we collected from a triplex coronata was probably what was remaining from what we inoculated at the beginning of the experiment. Regarding the impact that this few mite could have on a triplex coronata, we didn't record any symptoms, any sign of damage, and even we didn't record a significant difference in the plant size. While on Salsola tragus, we observe extensive goal already. So in conclusion, sure, a serious salsole can have a low reproduction on some non-target species under a laboratory condition, which for the real fit might means no choice condition. But he is not able to multiply on, the, on this plant species under field condition. And moreover, in both cases, controlled and field condition, he is not able to induce any damage or, or have any impact on these species. So we strongly believe that uh, solid doesn't pose risk for any of the U.S. species closely related to Salsola tragus. Here you can have a, a brief summary of the story of the permit process regarding this, this area of it might. At the moment, the situation is in a kind of a pending mode. And uh, our next step will be to present the data, the results from the last field experiment and check if uh, any additional information are needed in order to, to finally get the approval for the release of these, let's say, biocontrol agents against. And on behalf of BBCA and all our cooperator, I would like to thank you for, for the attention. We have just a minute for a question, and there is one in the box for you, which is, what taxonomic support can you access to identify new biocontrol agents? It depends from, from which is the agent. For the project that I presented, since more of them are about aerophyte mites, we are supported by Rico De Lillo from University of Bari and from University of Belgrade. Then we have a specialist for weevil, and it depends really from the agent. And then we have the support of molecular identification, mainly from Mary Claude from EBCL. Great, thank you. Oh, thank you, Harriet and Francesca.
at this point, we could um, jump into the next session. So I'll, I will hand it over to you, Carrie. I would like to start off the northeast section of the this summit. So I'm Lisa Tewksbury from the University of Rhode Island. I'm the director of the URI Biocontrol Lab, and I'm just giving you a couple of quick updates about our projects. So the big one that we've been working on for quite a few years is biological control of swallowworts. And uh, this one started for us back in 2005 with a PhD student, Aaron Weed, working with Dick Casagrande. And Aaron worked with CABI doing the foreign exploration and actually did quite a bit of work at CABI and then brought some of the potential agents back to the University of Rhode Island uh, quarantine facility. And he started off with five agents and after a couple of years, we focused in a little bit on the uh, Hypena opulenta as the most promising candidate. And another graduate student, Alex Hazelhurst, completed the host specificity testing for us. And all of us submitted a petition for release of Hypena opulenta, which um, TAG, Technical Advisory Group, approved in uh, 2013. And Canada, Rob Barcher was able to uh, make a release in Canada of Hypena opulenta in 2014 and has had some successful recoveries of that. We in the U.S., as has been mentioned, at least in the question and answer, our process of getting the permit was a little bit longer. And so we made our first releases in the fall of 2017. 2018 is where we got this damage rating in the graph here in the upper. Basically, I just show that to show one of my um, comments is that our field releases have confirmed that Hypena opulenta has improved performance in the shade. We see adult emergence around June 1st in Rhode Island. We started with larval releases inside cages like the large field one here and moved to adult releases, which were more successful based on Rob Barcher's recommendations. And uh, we seem to need to keep moving our releases earlier. We've had um, overwintering, but not establishment yet. The next one I want to just mention a little bit about a mile a minute. We've worked since 2009 releasing the weevil. I call it our latipes. <laughs> it was all of the work was done through Judy Huff Goldstein's lab in Delaware. And a couple of comments that they've made a uh, summary from their research is that it uh, seems to be more effective in the sun than the shade. Cool, wet springs do increase the mile a minute growth and limit the weevil population growth and the efficacy of the weevil seems improved in combination with plant competition. I spoke to a number of people uh, listed at the bottom from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut about their success with the weevil on mile a minute, and um, everyone has had very successful establishment and dispersal. The adult feeds on the tips, lays its eggs, and the larvae feed and kill uh, the stems. It can reduce percent cover and seed production, but doesn't seem to be able yet to reduce large mile a minute populations. And then Carrie, the last slide. Rhode Island was one of the eight states that did make the first release of uh, the psyllid for Japanese knotweed this year. And we had three release sites. We released about 2,400 total, about 800 in each site. And we did see adults all the way through. And actually, Fritzi Grevstad, who's coordinating this program from Oregon, suggested to me that I go back out in October and check to see if we could see uh, adults that were getting ready to overwinter. And we did find about 10 adults still on one of our sites. Uh, these were all released in uh, Kingston and Narragansett in Rhode Island, and we're going to follow it up next year. Thank you, Lisa, for queuing me up. I'm going to follow up what uh, Lisa was talking about with the uh, New York program for biological control of, of swallow work using Hypena opulenta. And this is a, a very collaborative effort. I want to acknowledge my co-PIs and a lot of partner agencies and particularly the New York uh, State DOT for funding the project and Christine Coley for her excellent management of our project. So just a, a little bit of brief background. Anyone who's worked with Hypena opulenta has experienced its sensitivity and a lot of rearing mortality, and that has really inhibited scaling up for large-scale releases. And so one of the things that we first did is took a recipe for artificial diet from Rob Borsche and we modified it and have been rearing individually on artificial diet after the third instar and this has allowed us to produce uh, large numbers of larvae with relatively low uh, mortality less than 20 percent as opposed to 50 percent plus 
on plants alone. So in central New York, where we're doing this research, we've established 10 long-term plots. This is all in pale swallowwort, as opposed to uh, Lisa Tewksbury's, which is mostly a black swallowwort. We utilize three habitats, open field, forest, and highway rights of way. And at each one of these release sites, we did a full native plant inventory, invasive plant inventory, and then metrics on swallowwort dominance and density as a baseline for our efforts going forward. In 2020, we did two releases, an early June release using adults, 30 males, 30 females in these six by six cages. And one of the, the cautionary tales about doing insect research is if you start patting yourself on the back, bad things will happen. Our first generation releases did really well. And unfortunately, they were the third laboratory generation because of COVID, I started rearing very early. And by the time we got to putting second generation in the field, a lot of our insects went into diapause, even under very long days. So we had much fewer insects to work with uh, in our generation two, but we put those out. As I said, our first generation results were really good. We had complete defoliation in half of our plots. We had significant defoliation in the others. Interestingly, we had good results in all three habitats and it was a very hot and exceptionally dry summer and I was very skeptical that they would do well in open field environments but all of our populations did very well. You can see in the uh, bottom corner the outline of a plot uh, a cage that was lifted in red and you can see that the caterpillars moved out into the surrounding forest and had completely defoliated swallowwort at a considerable distance from the plot. We're cautiously optimistic that uh, we can continue to release large numbers of hypena. In 2021, our core objective is to see if we have any overwintering survival, which would indicate perhaps establishment. And we're also going to continue to do large-scale releases at all of our sites. And we're also trying to estimate overwintering mortality of the pupae to figure out where uh, a lot of the population seem to disappear during the winter. And that is all I have. Thanks. Hi, my name is Mariana Such. I'm an assistant professor at Michigan State University. And my graduate student, Brianna Foster, is working on swallowbird biocontrol. And this project is funded by the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Uh, so the establishment success of weed biocontrol agents is around 60% worldwide. So there is quite a bit of room for improvement. And we know from most laboratory studies that the two most important factors for establishment is the founding size of populations, but also the genetic background of those releases. In a previous lab study, we found that those with higher genetic diversity established at higher rates at all founding sizes. And also in the seventh generation, those same releases with higher genetic diversity had higher uh, population densities. So genetic diversity can have both a short-term and long-term impact on establishment and population growth. And the new release of a biocontrol agent provides a great opportunity to test the importance of these factors in the field. And we used a factorial design for our field releases where we crossed founding size with genetic background. So we had two different founding sizes, a relatively lower, five pairs of adults or higher with 20 pairs of adults. And for each of these uh, release sizes, we used either uh, individuals with uh, standard or lower genetic diversity that consisted just of from our lab colony. That was a long-term colony, so probably a little bit inbred. And to create higher genetic diversity uh, in individuals, we crossed our lab colony with individuals from Canada. And so that yielded four treatments that you see on the right. And we released it at 18 sites, these four treatments with four or five replications for each of the treatments. And Brianna, my graduate student, will take over from here who is doing actually the work. Thank you. Uh, next slide, Kerry. Okay, so you guys can see that we've set up our sites in a randomized block design space to avoid our treatments from mixing and we have five blocks. 
We released in one meter squared cages and we released our adults corresponding to each treatment of founding size and genetic background. We removed the cages after two weeks and then at that time we saw larvae as you see in the pictures and defoliation by the larvae as well. And then after returning later for data collection, we did see evidence of dispersal of the larvae beyond the cage site. So for post-release monitoring, we set up eight half meter by half meter plots at each site, four serving as biocontrol plots in green and four serving as control plots in white, which will be treated with insecticide to exclude the biocontrol agent. Uh, in each plot, there are five individual swallowwort plants marked where we will be taking individual level data by collecting percent defoliation about once per month and then the number of seed pods at the end of the season. We're also taking plot level data, which will be taking stem density at the beginning of each season and the end of each season. And these are permanent plots, so we plan on taking this data for at least three years and hopefully longer. So far, it's too early for us to have seen significant damage in the field, but in our common garden experience, experiments where our cages are left on, we've been seeing good defoliation with about with five pairs of adults released in, in a cage. And from our data, we hope that we can understand how to maximize the establishment of biocontrol agents. Thank you. So I'm just going to take one minute. Dylan talked a little bit about our research program that's happening here in New York State to advance uh, swallowwort biocontrol with Hygiena violenta. I just wanted to take one minute to mention that the New York Invasive Species Research Institute, where I work, and is also looking to translate that into implementation. And so we actually have an outreach program on, and the objectives are, of this are to inform land managers and land owners about swallowwort and swallowwort biocontrol. Working with the research group to develop a simple standardized monitoring protocol to assess whether a gene is surviving and is effective in the field. We're establishing demonstration pages across New York to work with management agencies and show them how to release and monitor for hygiene impacts and establishment. We're developing training materials for these uh, releases, and we're also working with our database here in New York to make sure that managers who are releasing this can actually enter that information, both on the release and on the monitoring, into a database where we can uh, bring all the different agencies' data together and look at the effectiveness of the program. So I just wanted to highlight that. I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. I just wanted to point out my collaborators on this project are from the Cornell Carpet Extension Gate and Erie County. Also, the project coordinator is Audrey Bo. And if you have any questions or want more information, you can email me at below. And also thank our funders from the USDA NIFA on the Smith Weaver project. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Wade Simmons. I'm a graduate student working with Dr. Baron Blasi at Cornell University on water chestnut biocontrol. And for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of interacting with this really interesting plant, water chestnut is an aquatic annual that can transform freshwater ecosystems by taking over water surfaces. And so the insect that we're working with as a potential biocontrol agent is the water chestnut beetle. This is Gallaricella bermanica. It's a leaf feeding beetle and a few characteristics that make it particularly promising is that this beetle is capable of multiple overlapping generations per year. A female in a 30 to 50 day lifespan can produce up to 500 eggs and when these eggs hatch the larvae start immediately feeding on the water chestnut. So we get this combined feeding damage of both the larvae and the adults. So when we combine uh, this feeding damage impact with the life cycle of water chestnut, what we get are predictions of some sharp water chestnut population declines, mostly through the reduction of the number of seeds that are able to be produced in the presence of this insect. So this is looking really promising as an effective biocontrol agent. But what about the safety? So we have finished uh, the host specificity testing of this insect. We tested 57 uh, native species. Of those, we advanced nine to these more sophisticated multiple choice testing. And in these results, we find the majority of feeding damage and eggs are on water chestnut, which is exactly what we want. But we have a minority of feeding damage and eggs on this native plant water shield. And this was unsurprising to us. Uh, in the native range of the insect, which is Asia, this 
plant water shield is also native. And we know from studies there that this plant is occasionally used by the insect. And what we do know is that when this insect feeds on this plant, it is incapable of producing sustaining populations on a diet of water shield alone. And so we are continuing to explore these impacts on water shield, but we do have a good amount of evidence already about water shield. So like I mentioned, in the native range, these two species, this native plant water shield and the biocontrol insect coexist, and there's no evidence of population level declines of the native plant. We also know that this is a suboptimal host for the insect that we're studying. And here in, in North America, where water shield is also uh, native, this plant is heavily attacked by native insects, yet have very robust populations. So robust, in fact, that um, this plant is targeted for management because it con is considered a nuisance. So in conclusion, we're working with a really promising biocontrol agent. It's looking extremely effective in reducing populations of water chestnut. And we also believe that the risks to native plants, in particular this water shield plants, are very low. We have no evidence to suggest that uh, the feeding damage will reduce populations of water shield, which we argue should be the metric in which we evaluate the risks. We're compiling all this evidence now. We hope to uh, submit our petition to TAG in early 2021. We have additional Brazinia impact uh, studies planned for the upcoming year and we're also uh, doing some research on interactions with native insects that also use water chestnut. So with that I'll conclude. Hi I'm Stacy. I'm a postdoc at Cornell University and over the past several years I've had the pleasure of working with Baron Blasi and his team at Cornell. So the topics and the data that I'm covering today are the result of decades worth of work from Baron's lab as well as work with many collaborators a lot of whom are on the call today. So I just wanted to jump right in into an update on Phragmites australis biocontrol. And as uh, Harriet mentioned, there have been two highly host-specific Arcanara stem boring moths that have been submitted to TAG for approval for field release. And unfortunately, the update, at least for the US right now, is that right now we're stalled in getting that final field release approval. The good news is, Rob might touch base on this in a little bit, but releases have actually already happened in Canada. So for us here in the US and in New York State, we're basically just assuming that, assuming the insects established, which we find likely, the insects will arrive, it's just a matter of when. So right now our focus is really going to be monitoring for insect arrival from Ontario into the US. And regardless of what pathway the insects get here, perhaps we do get approval for U.S. field release through APHIS, but the mass production of these insects has already been streamlined by our collaborators at CABI as well as in Europe. So we're ready to hit the ground running. So in the meantime, we're focusing on continuing to maintain and expand our long-term monitoring. So we have sites throughout New York State and the region focused on looking at the effect of native versus invasive Phragmites on native plant diversity. And we've also been developing over the past several years bioacoustic monitoring. So putting out recorders into the field to assess baseline information about what the bird, bat, and frog communities look at, like in native versus introduced Phragmites. And so really, we're playing a waiting game at the moment, but in some, we're trying to make sure that we're really well prepared for when the insects do arrive, both in terms of rearing protocols, but also in terms of being able to assess when these insects arrive, if they actually effectively mitigate the negative impacts of invasive Phragmites on the plants, birds, bats, and frogs that we care about. Again, as Harriet and Lisa both mentioned, another program where insects have recently been released is the Japanese knotweed biocontrol. And so the Scyllid Afalari itadori, as was mentioned, was released in eight states this year. Again, this is just some pictures of field releases, but the general pattern seems to be that they can develop, produce thousands of eggs when they're protected in these mesh sleeves, as you see in the center bottom. Unfortunately, when we went back a week later, we found no established manure site, so we weren't able to find a single insect at any developmental stage. And in fact, that seems to be the pattern across most of the sites they were released at this year. So I think it was 22 out of the 27 sites we weren't able to detect the insects after returning to check on them. 
And so for us, that's left us with this question of where do we go from here? So we could hold out hope that maybe these cells will secretly build up larger populations over time. But that's also builds on the assumption that large populations of these psyllids will actually have a noticeable impact on the knotweeds. And I would say that even rearing high numbers of these psyllids on small test knotweed plants, we really aren't able to see, at least for us here on our hybrid knotweeds, any noticeable impact. So this has really led a group of us to have a bit of a reality check and question how we want to move forward with this program. And for us, we're thinking very carefully about all of the different organisms that we've already found to feed on knotweeds in their native ranges. For example, there might be new insect species that we could discover with field surveys in Japan, China, and maybe even Taiwan. And of course, all of this, we're starting to network and build collaborations, but all of this is a bit dependent on what the travel restrictions look like over the next couple of years. But in particular, there's a handful of species that were identified early on in biocontrol development for this plant as potential candidates for biological control, but were rejected. And I don't think I have time to go into the reasons right now why we think they deserve a second look, but I just want to point out that we're interested in a handful of species that go across multiple feeding gills. So we're looking at leaf feeders, root feeders, and stem miners. In general, we just feel like there's a lot more to learn about these species before rejecting them. For example, it could be that these populations we've looked at before actually represent multiple cryptic insect species, and those species could differ in their host preference and feeding behavior. So to pave the way for future biological control, we are establishing a collaboration, a transcontinental collaboration. As part of this, we've already established three common gardens of knotweeds, one in the US, one in Germany, and one in China. And each common garden represents 50 populations, rhizomes that were collected across 2,000 kilometer transects within each of these regions. And so far this past season, we focused on using these populations to better understand the variation in these plants, whether that's driven by local adaptation, how differences in their defense and performance map out to herbivore preference, but one of the things I'm really excited about is that we're trying right now to ship plant samples from US and Germany to China so that we can actually have a master common garden in China, which will be super useful for conducting future impact assessments when we're looking at additional complementary biocontrol for the psyllid that maybe will be a bit more high impact. Lastly, thinking about complementary insects as biocontrol agents, I just want to mention quickly that we've been assessing the success of biological control of purple loosestrife now that it's been nearly three decades since these insects were first released in North America. And as a refresher, in the 1990s, there were four different biological control agents that were released. So there was two leaf feeders, the Gallarosella species. There was one root feeder, the Hylobia species and one fruit feeder, the Nanotheus. And this has of course been a team effort as have all these other projects. And the first thing that we've discovered in the past several years in returning to roadside surveys is that all these biological control agents are very well established and widespread throughout not just central New York, but also the broader region. We also are analyzing and finalizing data from long-term monitoring plots, looking at the effect of purple loosestrife on native plant diversity. So these sites were established before biocontrol release at five different locations and represent more than 30 different sites. And you can see just visually that there's been a big difference in the landscape before and after biological control has been released. And we're starting to be able to back this up with data so the bolded lines are just averages across different locations, but we can see through time, purple loosestrife density has clearly decreased. The number of inflorescences and the number of flowers per inflorescences has also in general decreased through time. And then most importantly, we're seeing an increase in plant species through time as well as the density of the purple loosestrife decreases. So far, we look like we have some really good data about loosestrife being a success story, at least here in our region. So the insects have been, become widespread and they have successfully mitigated the negative impacts of the invasion and that we see this increase in native plant diversity. So I just want to leave you with saying that it seems like purple loosestrife has become gone from an ecological menace to a roadside attraction. 
And pulling this back together with all the biological control programs, I think it's an important message to think about needing the need for assessments over longer time periods. And that we, of course, as all of us know, we need patients. Success for biological control takes time, and hopefully we'll get there for all of the programs that we're working on developing. Thank you. I'd also now like to move and invite our southeastern speakers to start. Hi, my name is Rodrigo Diaz. I'm going to speak about biological control of giant Salvinia. In this case, we're using the Salvinia weevil. This weevil is highly successful in the southern part of Louisiana. As you can see in these pictures, it just takes a How's few that? months for them to control the plant. But Much it's better, a, thank you. It is over winter. We maintain a mass rearing program of the Salvinia weevil. We use open ponds, as in this case, where people come and harvest the plants and they take the Salvinia to the new locations. At LSU, we have an extension program where we have educational materials for our stakeholders. And actually, we have an Instagram account. In research, we are very interested in improving the biocontrol of Salvinia in temperate regions. We have severe winter mortality of this Brazilian population in the north part of the state. We have compared the population dynamics of the weevil in the north as well as the southern parts of the state. And we are finding that in the north of Louisiana, there is a delay in the recruitment of two individuals in the population as you have seen in this graph with a dotted line which represents the northern part of the state. We have evaluated the use of fabrics to improve the microclimate during the winter. We compared the cold tolerance of a population of Salvinia weevils from Argentina and is actually more cold tolerant. The population of Argentina has greater survival compared to with the population of Louisiana. So we're very interested in bringing this population from Argentina to the United States and we're working with the USDA APHIS to get a permit of release of this new population. The final message is that biocontrol is the most sustainable method of control of this weed. We need to fight the problem early in the season rather than the middle of the summer. Mass rearing help us having access to weevils to areas that are needed and research is focused on improving the biocontrol in temporary regions. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Veronica Manrique, and I'm going to talk about biological control of air potato in Louisiana. This is a collaboration between Southern University and Louisiana State University. Aero potato vine, the Ascorea bulbifera, is a native to Asia and is an invasive species here in Southern Eastern United States. Beetle Liliosiris cheney is being used as a biocontrol agent in Florida since 2011 and has reduced the growth and the reproduction of this vine. After the success in Florida, the air potato beetle was released in Louisiana in 2016. The next year, in 2017, we found air potato beetles in all release sites, and this was the first report that air potato beetles can survive the winter in Louisiana. However, in 2018, we found that beetles were absent in some of the release sites, but that was a very unusual winter since we have snow here in Louisiana, and that could have affected the overwintering survival of the beetles. Releases continue in 2019 and 2020, and beetles have been found in all the release sites since then. Long-term studies are being conducted in three field sites in Louisiana to measure the impact of the air potato beetle, and Charity Schaefer is conducting this study since 2018. This is some pictures of our field sites. This is Tutan Park in June 2019, and you can see that we found a lot of feeding of air potato beetle, and the plants are not growing as aggressive. We compare this to another site in the same park where beetles were not found. You can see how aggressive the vine can get. This is the same site in 2020 and we see good control in the first site. And the second site we found that beetles started feeding early and were able to reduce the growth of the potato vine.
we also want to understand how environmental factors affect air potato beetle. And so Felicia Mencho is doing some laboratory and overwintering studies to understand the cold tolerance of the beetle. To learn more about our program, go to the LSU Ag Center website or check our brochure at Southern University. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Adi with USDA ARS Invasive Plant Resource Laboratory in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Today, I will be summarizing five-year field research outcomes of Dioscore Volvifera Biological Control in Florida. Please note that this is a team research effort in which many scientists from IPRL and other agencies have significantly contributed to the success of this project. Since the introduction in 1905, the potato plant has invaded all 67 Florida counties and southern parts of uh, neighboring states. Vines, blankets, mother, and kill other vegetation and produce large number of uh, potent uh, vegetative propagules called bulbils. Uh, vines senesce in late fall and sprout in spring from bulbils and underground tubers. In Florida, the potato vine life cycle has four components. So vines, uh, occasional male flowers, vegetative propagules, uh, which are bulbils and underground tubers. Vines die in late fall, bulbils drop to the ground, uh, bulbils and ground tubers, uh, underground tubers sprout in late spring, produce vines, no seeds uh, being reported in North America so far. Uh, year potato infestations are very difficult to manage since herbicidal, mechanical, and uh, cultural methods are deemed inefficient and pose uh, collateral damage to the non target plants. Therefore, Florida Ex Exotic Pest Plant Council uh, recommended biological control as one of the appropriate methods for this with uh, management in Florida. Subsequently, uh, during foreign survey in 2002, we discovered uh, Lilioses chennai, a foliage feeding beetle in Nepal, and later in China in 2010. Both bite types were found to be highly host specific. Lilioses chennai is multivoltin with four life stages adult, stage, larvae, and pupae, and completes its life cycle within 30 to 40 days. Another congenerate beetle, Lilioses isina specializing on bulbil destruction discovered and discovered and imported from same area as LCDI happens to be highly host specific as well. It is in the pipeline waiting for final approval for field releases in the near future. After obtaining field release permits, IPRL, FDAC and UF teamed up and mass produced and released 812,000 beetles throughout the year potato distribution range uh, in Florida. Beetles Populations have established in Florida that where insecticide application for other insects is frequent. Five year replicated field studies with control using granular systemic insecticide and beetle treatment in natural year potato infestations in five sites and evaluated LCNI biocontrol impact on the volvifera and associated plant communities in Florida. Now we'll talk a little bit about the impact. The beetles treatment mean percentage of air potato vine cover uh, gradually dropped during 2012-16 down to 21% uh, versus down to 34% in control. Vine damage remained uh, above 35% in beetle treatment while it remained below 15 to 20% in control. So 15% vine damage appears to be uh, the lowest threshold for negative impact occurring on vine cover. So vine damage in control was due to feeding frenzy by the spillover beetles from adjacent areas where defoliated vines die prematurely. So now back to the production. At the onset of the experiment in 2012, bulb density and biomass were similar in control and beetle treatments. In by 2016, 16, bulbil density and biomass in beetle treatment decreased by 98 and 85% respectively in, relative, in relation to 2012 level. Also in uh, control, bulbil density decreased by 75%, but individual bulbil sizes increased. Uh, bulbil density decrease in control uh, attributed to the vine feeding damage by the spillover beetle from outside. Reduced bulbil density and biomass will suppress the upgrade of further dispersal and uh, invasion potential. Now, uh, for additional information on this research, please refer to the published literature, literature listed on this slide. 
like to thank comprehensive Everglades restoration project South Florida Water Management District, Army Corps of Engineers, Miami-Dade County Durham for funding and Nepal Agricultural Research Council, Chinese Academy of Science for facilitating foreign surveys, conducting preliminary research and shipping biochemical agents to our quarantine facility. Thank you. Hi everybody, this is Greg Wheeler, USDA ARS in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We'll be talking today about biological control of Chinese tallow, Tridex sibifera. It's a member of the E4BAC. This has been a team effort with the Chinese Academy of Science scientists, Dr. Ding, Dr. Wang, Dr. Zhang, as well as Matt Purcell, the CSIRO lab in Brisbane, Australia. Chinese tallow is a, an attractive tree that grows to 10 to 20 meters in height. Its leaves change color in the fall and they drop during the winter months. And they recover, of course, in the spring, produce fruit flowers and fruit again in the, the following fall. And those fruit are bright white, thus its common name of popcorn tree, also known as tallow tree or Florida aspen. It was first introduced in the 1780s in South Carolina. Uh, it now is distributed throughout the, the Gulf states from Houston all the way to South Carolina. It's become one of the dominant woody species in many forests and wetlands. But its infestations impact uh, attempts to recover the endangered whooping crane and the Atwater's prairie chicken populations. Despite all of our efforts, it continues to have an expanding range. We estimate that it's going to cost between 200 and 400 million dollars to control over the next 20 years. We suggest that biological control can be consistent in this effort by being a self-sustaining, cost-effective means of control. The native range of Chinese tallow, of course, is China, where it occurs south of the Yellow River to about Hong Kong. It's been a cultivated species in China for hundreds of years. So there's a lot known about the insects associated with Chinese tallow. The colleagues there compiled a list of about 200 herbivore species, which we could then use to decide species that might be suitable for biocontrol. We imported many of these into our quarantine in Fort Lauderdale and began testing to determine which ones might be safe. These included this leaf rolling beetle, the Cochicolera split beetle, Gadrotha fusca defoliating caterpillar, a leaf rolling member of the Dicomeris genus, and the Saurus geometric species. But upon further testing, three of these species had to be dropped from further consideration. So we focused our attention on the Cochicolera's and Gadrotha fusca. But first, I'd like to just make mention of these galling species in the Schizomyia genus. These are Cisomyia gallers. They form galls on the tips and on the stems of Chinese tallow. There's a probably a complex of at least three species. Of the Cochicolera's, this is the flea beetle. The adults feed on the leaves, they, where they also lay eggs. Those eggs then hatch into larvae, which drop to the ground. Those already penetrate into the soil and feed on, on the, the roots. The larval stage takes about two weeks where they then pupate and emerge, the adults emerge, and then repeat the cycle feeding on the leaves. The other species is Gadrotha fusca. It completes all of its stages of its life cycle in the foliage. It goes through five instars, it completes development in about 25 to 30 days. This latter species has an enormous appetite. Uh, it can consume its entire body mass every single day. And just to demonstrate, at the bottom are six leaves that were laid out. A single larva was offered those in two days and left only small fragments behind. So we wanted to do a, a, an impact study to determine how much damage this species would cause to saplings that were about 50 centimeters in height. So we introduced either no larvae as a control, one larva, or five larvae. We let them feed for two generations, and we measure the number of leaves, the biomass, and as well as the growth of these trees. We found that five larvae reduced the total biomass by about a half compared to the controls that had no larvae. Above ground biomass was reduced to about 40% of the control, and leaf biomass was reduced to about 5% of the control. So just to summarize, we still would like to get back to China and continue work on these Shaiza Maia gall farmers. But until then, we still have a lot of work to do on, on the insects that we still have in quarantine. 
um, these are just awaiting a release permit from APHIS. And once that's granted, we'll be able to field release the Kasha Colaris, the Fleet Beetle, as well as Gadrantha Fusca. So thank you, everybody, for your attention. Um, look forward to working with you soon. Ligodium microfilum, old world climbing fern, has a pantropical distribution in the native range. It was first reported as naturalized in southeastern Florida in 1965. Range expansion is ongoing in peninsular Florida, and the search for natural enemies in the native range is focused on Southeast Asia and Northern Australia. This invasive vine can outcompete native species in a variety of habitats. Uh, it grows in the form of rachises or leaves that extend from rhizomes. These rachises are indeterminately growing up to 30 meters. They can trail horizontally or climb vertically, causing these tree skirts, which can carry fire into tree canopies. This is really difficult to manage because herbicides and prescribed burns tend to top kill the plant, but don't necessarily kill the rhizome, so you get rapid regrowth. It also reproduces via tremendous production spores. This makes the plant especially difficult to manage in remote conservation areas such as tree islands in Nash uh, Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge and in habitats in Everglades National Park. Two agents are being mass reared and released in Florida. The brown ligodium moth, Neomycetema conspiricatalis, is a defoliating moth that can outbreak and cause these extensive brownouts. So all the brown vine has been defoliated by the moth. However, these outbreaks tend to be sporadic and ephemeral, and they don't necessarily kill the rhizome. So like fire and herbicide, you get rapid regrowth following a defoliation event. We've released about 3 million of the moth and more than 3 million of the mite flora caris terapy. This is an area of thiad that causes leaf roll galls the mites reproduce within the galls, and they'll also damage the apical meristems. So here's a healthy fiddlehead, here's one that's been damaged by the mite, and you can also get a loss of apical dominance from this damage. So the plant just produces a whole bunch of leaves but doesn't grow vertically. So we've documented up to a 75% reduction in rachis growth rates from this mite damage. However, neither agent is causing enough damage in the field to reach management goals. So my team is very focused on integrated weed management in collaboration with a number of agencies. For example, we have studied post-burn colonization of the agents. This is a prescribed burn in Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. Additional burns were conducted in Everglades National Park, where collaborators from Florida International University tracked mite activity pre-burn, which was about 50 to 70 percent of the focal plants had mite damage, and within nine months of the burn, we regained that level of damage. By 15 months post-burn, nearly all plants had mite activity. Similarly, in work with the University of Florida and South Florida Water Management District, we're documenting mite galling of uh, tree islands that have been treated so about 24 months post-application, more than 80% of the ligodium sporlings on islands treated with glyphosate have mite damage. And again, we're seeing the same loss of apical dominance. We have an extensive study running in the field now, again, looking at interactions between the two agents and herbicides where we have different levels of herbicide treatments and we are chemically excluding the agents in half of the plots. We've constructed these artificial tree trellises, so we have surface area that we can both measure ligodium growth on and harvest biomass off of. We're also collaborating with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to use drones to release the agents in difficult to access places and plan to monitor the agents with drones. In quarantine, we have three candidate agents in different stages of testing. The first, the Cranbid Ligomycetema stria, is another defoliating moth. This agent is the closest to being petitioned. We're also working with a soft line, Neostrombocerus albicomus. This insect is from Thailand and it can reach outbreak densities in the native range. 
And finally, the Noctua calipistria exotica. This is a pretty large caterpillar. It's a voracious feeder and 50 plants into the test plant list. It is thus far proving to be a Ligodium specialist and we're pretty optimistic about that. We thank the many people and organizations who make this work possible. Hello all. I'm Melissa Smith, a research ecologist with the USDA, and I work on Melaleuca and early Facacia. I do this work with Carrie Mentier, Matt Purcell, and Phil Tipping. Both Melaleuca and early Facacia are Australian plants and arrived through intentional introductions in the early 20th century. The most recent work with Melaleuca is occurring at Big Cypress National Preserve, looking at the interaction of fire, Melaleuca, and its biological control agents. Big Cypress is north of Everglades National Park and encompasses several different habitat types, including cypress domes and pine woodlands. This preserve is a good representative of the interplay between water and fire that determines the vegetation in the Everglades. Melaleuca was once quite dense in these areas with conducive hydrology shown in the map in the dark shaded areas. However, it's been drastically reduced through treatment, removal, and sustained control from biological control agents. That is until 2018 when the raccoon fire set off a significant recruitment event in areas with remnant melaleuca trees. When we arrived and surveyed these plots, biological control agents, especially the midge and the weevil, were in high densities on the seedlings as seen here in the photo. The pink areas are midge damage and you can see the brown areas which indicates larval feeding from the weevil. Data from this and previous studies shows that even without biological control, Melaleuca goes through a three to five year self-thinning phase where roughly 96% of seedlings will not survive. Where biological control assists most is in the continuing control of these remote populations. Biological control decreases biomass and seedling height by 70 to 75% and stops seedlings from ever reaching reproductive stage. An additional agent is being pursued because in extremely wet areas, as seen here in the graph, mortality decreases by 15 to 20 percent. This insect, another midge, is currently going through the approval process. Early facacia is increasingly concerning in natural areas in South Florida. It lives in seasonal riverways in Australia, which are drier than Melaleuca swamps, but not xeric, so it thrives in the seasonal, seasonally wet areas of Florida. We began surveys throughout Australia for suitable agents in 2016. These have taken us to extremely remote parts of Australia and given us the opportunity to work with indigenous rangers for long-term insect surveys. Over the course of the last four years, several promising agents have emerged. The first biological control organism that we are investigating is Calamila intimorata. It has a 23-day life cycle and beetles can live over six months in laboratory conditions. Adults lay several hundred eggs over their lifetime. Both adult beetles and larvae eat leaf tips and tender foliage. This insect is still in quarantine and has completed approximately 50% of its host range trials with no signs of significant non-target damage. The second biological control insect we're pursuing for early facacia is this galling wasp in the trichologaster genus. This wasp was particularly exciting to find because the congener is used for biological control in South Africa with great success. We have established rearing protocols for this insect and a laboratory colony is established at the Australian Biological Control Lab. Hopefully these two insects continue to show extreme specificity and will impact the reproduction and spread of early facacia in South Florida and keep it from being as problematic as Melaleuca or acacias in other regions such as South Africa. Thank you all for your time. Hello everyone, I'm Dale Halberter from the USDA ARS Invasive Plant Research Lab in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I will provide an update on the biological control of Brazilian pepper tree. This is a collaborative endeavor, and we work closely with the University of Florida and the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services on field projects and mass rearing and release of the agents. Since its arrival from Brazil as an ornamental in the 1840s, Brazilian pepper tree has spread to over 700,000 acres in Florida. It is highly invasive in both natural and urbanized areas 
costing over a million dollars annually to manage. Getting this weed under control is one of the top priorities of the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan in Southern Florida. After years of foreign exploration and host specificity testing in quarantine, two insects have been approved for release as biological control agents in Florida. Pseudophilothrips ichini is a thrips whose larvae and adults feed gregariously, targeting flushing stem tips and new foliage. Califia latiforceps is a psyllid whose nymphs form pit galls in the leaves. Currently, only the thrips have been released as mass rearing is still in the development phase for the psyllid. The rest of this talk will focus on the thrips. When thrips densities are high enough, feeding damage results in the death of the apical meristem and the shoot tip becomes necrotic and withered. This can cause significant damage, especially when conditions are ideal for high thrips densities, such as in our colonies. At lower thrips densities, we often see more leaf damage. Feeding on young leaves causes crinkled necrotic patches that become more apparent as the leaves expand and mature. Through the efforts of IPRL, UF, and FDAX, over 400,000 thrips have been released in Florida since May 2019. Numbers have significantly increased as we have continued to improve our mass rearing methods. We began monitoring impact in planted garden plots at both IPRL and UF. Data shown here are for the plot at IPRL. We began releasing thrips every month or so beginning in July 2019. Baseline tip mortality was typically less than 20% before release. After thrips release, tip mortality doubled as mortality induced by thrips feeding contributed to overall mortality. In another collaborative project with UF, we have been monitoring transects of wild Brazilian pepper tree. Shown here are the data for IPRL's transects in Big Cypress National Preserve. Damage was assessed monthly on a scale from zero to 10, with 10 being damaged and at least one of the three forms seen on branches across the entire outer canopy. Damage appeared to fluctuate both with season and timing of thrips releases. The pie charts show the relative proportions of the damage forms observed. Our collaborators at UF have conducted tests to determine the ecological host range of the thrips to confirm the host specificity tests conducted in quarantine labs. Here, thrips were released onto both non-target plant species closely related to Brazilian pepper tree and the target Brazilian pepper tree. Thrips steadily declined on the non-targets, and once Brazilian pepper tree was cut to simulate plant death, the thrips on the dying Brazilian pepper tree stems did not appear to move to the adjacent non-targets. This further confirms the specificity and ecological safety of the thrips agent. We and our collaborators will continue to release and monitor thrips populations and their direct impacts on Brazilian pepper tree. Some future directions include studies on thrips predation in both laboratory and field experiments, assessments on the impacts of canopy thinning on understory plant communities, and evaluations of the efficacy of incorporating thrips into an IPM strategy with herbicides. I'd like to acknowledge our funding sources, both internal and through external collaborators, their contributions have been invaluable to the success of these projects on scales needed to achieve landscape and ecosystem level impact. Lastly, if you have any questions about our projects and the data presented here, please send me an email and I'll put you in touch with the corresponding investigator. I can also provide a list of recent publications on Brazilian pepper tree upon request. Thank you for tuning in to this biological control update and stay safe out there. Okay, thank you, Southeast presenters. That was really great, and we appreciate your, your organization there and filming everything ahead of time. So um, we are moving into the Western update, and we have a number of different speakers here, and we will go ahead and start with Jeff Littlefield. I'm Jeff Littlefield from Montana State University. I want to just briefly update the status of the hoary crest gall mite, Asteria drabi in Montana. Also, I want to uh, recognize my foreign cooperators, Massimo, Francesca, and, and Javid, whose help on this project. Area, the hoary crest mite is an areophyte mite, and if you're not familiar with areophytes, they tend to be fairly small, not very typical of mites in that they're elongated, have reduced number of legs, 
Also, they're very small. To give you a perspective, we tend to use eyelash brushes to transfer mites. And if you have one on the end of the eyelash, you can just barely see it, especially if your eyes are much uh, younger than mine. So they're fairly small. And being small, they're readily wind dispersed. and hop rides on other insects. Being small, they're also somewhat difficult to work with in the lab. Many aerophyte mites produce galls. In this case, Asteriodrabi produces primarily galls and the flower buds and preventing seed formations, and they come in different forms. If the populations are high or the plants are susceptible, a secondary Stems might be galled up and stunted. Also, the whole plant might be stunted as well. For the last two years, we've been making releases. Seriodrabi is the first agent to be put out on Horicress. We've been using three release techniques. Our primary release has been excising galls, taking them out to the field, putting them at the tips of susceptible plants, and parafilming them up. This year, we've tried some other techniques where we gather the plants together in a little teepee and put the galls in where they all join, or we've blenderized galls and sprinkled them on plants. And typically, what we have done is use GPS points and inoculate five plants per point. Uh, also, we go into the site and mow small areas to stimulate regrowth of plants later in the year. So mice are very particular about what stage they uh, can in induce galls so we can extend our uh, release period by mowing these areas. We've made two releases in 2019 last year and recovered galls at both sites this year. Our primary site is in Broadwater County We've been working with that because it's a fairly extensive site. White Top it covers an area of approximately one section, which is a one square mile. In 2019, we uh, observed galls at about 14% of our point infestations, about, about 3% of total plants being producing galls. Interestingly, this year when we went back, plants that were infested, right. probably about three times as many. So we're not quite sure exactly what happened. The galls and the mites have probably moved down onto the roots or in protected areas during 2019 and just hung out there for the winter. Interestingly, at this particular site, we had a really bad grasshopper outbreak. And by midsummer, nearly all the white tops were just, just uh, stems more than anything. And all the galls were eaten. Uh, this year, we put out a comparable number, actually a little bit uh, larger number of galls and of our point infestations, about 20% had galls, which is about 4% uh, of the total plants inoculated. It's just a couple of things that we've noticed, no galls were produced in mowed areas for some reason. Maybe we'll find some next year. And there's no uh, evidence of uh, immediate dispersal. Almost all that we found galls on this year were inoculated last year. What do we have planned for the future? A lot of people are interested in the mite and obtaining it. We're going to be using Bozeman as an area to, to bring in the mites, move them to affiliate stations in Nez Perce and Colorado, and from there they go into more of a redistribution mode. These will be redundant populations. So with that, I just want to acknowledge my funding partners, and thank you for your time. This is John Gaskin. I'm a a botanist with USDA ARS in Sydney, Montana, and I do genetics in support of weed control. One thing we're awaiting is for flowering rush. Cabby's doing a great job on developing the weevil for that. And quarantine, we're growing flowering rush in there. It's growing very happily, and we await some of those bagus weevils. But apparently, they're a little hard to rear over in Switzerland, and we're anticipating probably the same issue here, but we're going to give it a shot. Maybe next season we'll be able to get some for rearing inside quarantine. In the meantime, I'm working on the genetics of flowering rush. There's a map of the U.S. showing the different uh, colors indicating different genotypes. We have in the West, we have the blue genotype 1, a triploid, which is invading mostly. Over in the East, around New York and everything, they're more of a genotype 4 kind of thing. Why, do, why does that matter? It doesn't really matter too much for the weevil, but the UK is looking at a smut that attacks flowering rush. 
and the smut that they found did not like to attack genotype one. So we need to keep finding some origins of where genotype one, the blue genotype of the flowering rush came from. And uh, luckily through lots of collecting by folks, especially Patrick at Cabby, this year he sent us some samples out of the Netherlands, which were an exact match to our genotype one, which is our big invasive genotype in the West. So now we have a location where they can go and take a look and see if there are any diseases or other biocontrol agents hanging out in those populations in Europe and maybe develop them for biocontrol. On another front, Natalie West, who's speaking next, and I are revisiting leafy spurge. And basically my question is what species is invading North America? Because the flora of North America very recently said, Euphorbia escula is considered just to be a waif and really everything invading is Euphorbia vergata. And they're supposed to be told apart by morphology, mostly leaf morphology, but other people have said in the past, well, leaf characters were of little value in separating these things. So are we dealing with taxonomic issues here? Is there hybridization between different species from Europe going on? And the big question, are we matching agents with invasive species? Do, you, do we have the right agent for what's really in the U.S.? So a genetic study just shows this cluster of different colored plants, blue ones being North America forming a big cluster. And the main story is that Euphorbia escula, which is green dots from Europe, and Euphorbia vergata, which is red dots from Europe, are really quite more, uh, similar to each other and mixed up, uh, even though they have different morphologies. So we don't know the answer yet, gonna still be looking into that and see what the heck's really here in North America, because we can see some of the red dots from Europe in our North American cluster, and also some of the green Euphorbia escula from Europe, North American cluster. So, to be continued. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about is not even biocontrol, so I apologize, but the folks in Oregon had found a carduous morphology. They thought it was close to carduous pycnocephalus, but they thought it certainly didn't quite look like it. It had these sort of elongated support for the flower heads that you don't see in pycnocephalus. So some good folks worked with me this year and we published uh, some information that there is a new species of carduous in North America. None of them are native and they're all relatively invasive. We determined it was different from pycnocephalus using DNA sequence data. It showed about a four to 5% difference from all other carduous species in North America. So that kind of nailed it as being something else. And it was very close to some things with badly named specimens out of Turkey, but it turns out it should be carduous cinereus, which is Turkish thistle. And right now, Turkish thistle is just found mostly in Hell's Canyon between Idaho and Oregon right there. And the green indicates where Pycnocephalus, the Italian thistle is. And that's all I've got. If you have any questions about genetics on invasions, just to give me an email. Thanks very much. Hello everyone. I am Natalie West and I'm a research ecologist stationed with John at the uh, Pest Management Research Unit out of Sydney, Montana. I'm going to talk a little bit today about a project that I'm working on with John and other collaborators who are also on this call looking at and evaluating um, the Leafy Spurge Biological Control Program, where it's effective, and can we improve the management recommendations we're making to, at a large scale, using Apsona particularly agents. They were interested in teasing out some of the general limitations to biological control. There's a lot of, was a lot of pre-release and early data on what um, was, might be limiting agents, but 20 years into the program, we, can, we are now at a point where we can actually look across a broad uh, landscape to see what are true limitations versus um, local or site level limitations. So John is doing some genetics on this on the, at the plant level. There's probably complicated genetics um, at the agent level, but we can't do everything. So basically, we've started this project in 2019. We managed to sample 96 sites across Idaho, uh, North Dakota, and Montana. We used a modified SIMP sampling system. So if you're familiar with that program, you'll know what we were doing. We looked at um, soil characters, plant genetics. We sampled the weed density, plant community, as well as beginning this year, the roots to look for actual feeding at the sites. And these things are all to give us a local scale evaluation of basically what the agent's abundance is and what um, the weed population looks like. 
And the things that are italicized will be sampling over a th repeated sampling over a three year period. So we can look at how we can uh, control for yearly variation in some of these parameters. And then we're also going to um, link some of our local scale data to larger scale patterns. I'm looking at landscape level patch abundance uh, measured with drone sampling, as well as large scale climate and landscape variables in GIS. So then we can try to start to partition what local scale limitations scale up to larger scale and more general patterns. So what we've found so far after the first year of sampling in 2019, these are our sites and I've ordinated them based on the soil characteristics. Points that are closer together are more similar in soils, points that are further apart are less similar. And what you can see is that we've sampled a variety of soil conditions. The point size reflects weed density. So you can see that there's very extreme variation in weed density across the sites we sampled. What we did find is that there's no clear patterns of associated with soil characteristics. And this has been one of the main points that's uh, been suggested to help you choose which Apsona agent it is. And so we're hoping I can tease that data in a little further to see if there are any general patterns with soil texture or nutrients. And so these are the beetle data. And so we, I'm just going to show you the Apsona beetles. Those are the most widely dispersed agents and was the focus of Team Leafy Spurge uh, distribution and education efforts in the 90s and 2000s that really implemented Leafy Spurge biocontrol over a large scale. What you can see is in 2019, that we actually found Apsona at 92 of our 94 sites. So the agent is very well um, distributed across the landscape. Only four sites that we sampled did not have Apsona. And interestingly enough, two of those sites, though they didn't have Apsona flea beetles, did have Oberia, which was another agent that was released, but has been considered, we, don't, we know less about its efficacy um, over time. What you can see is there is, in the upper left-hand graph, you can see that there is a rel differences in the relative abundance of the black and brown beetles, which is too kind of a, a coarse way to think about it. In the landscape, you can see some have more, some have less, few of them have equal. Brown tends to have particularly larger populations, perhaps. In terms of the cover of leafy spurge, this is uh, a percent cover estimate in the lower left-hand corner. And you can see most of our sites we're at a plot level, the community, it makes up less than 20% of the community cover. So overall, a majority of sites we're seeing have less than 20% cover of the community in leafy spurge. So what can I tell you in terms of our preliminary findings? Agent communities varied widely across sites, but we, we have yet to see a clear association with soil variables. We do, were able to collect four Aphthona species, Obria, and Hylies, which is the hawk moth released for leafy spurge. However, neither uh, spurgia agent has been apparent, but we don't have optimized sampling for, for those kinds of organisms. Aphthona beetles do vary in relative abundance, but have similar absence rates. They're around 15 to 20 percent um, of sites had one beetle or the other. At high spurge densities, you do see low agent abundance. However, more agents are not necessarily associated with lower spurge density. So this uh, will require a little more work on our part. And so in closing, I'd like to say, based on team leafy spurge recommendations, we would expect maximum control to be a leafy spurge density of 5% of the plant community. And about 20% of the sites we've sampled so far currently approximate this cover. So there seems to be considerable success. And I just want to point out that you should document releases because that's been a hard part of this program and I will end there. I'm Lincoln Smith. I'm a research scientist at the USDA ARS lab in Albany, California. And I'm happy to present an update on yellow star thistle rosette weevil, Ceratopion bassicornia. Now, this is a new agent available for yellow star thistle. It was proposed back in 2006 as a petition to tag and it got blocked back in 2009, so there's a 10 year hiatus, but APHIS has approved it in 2019. The, starting back again, Ceratopion bassicorni is a weevil for yellow star thistle, which is a new agent which was approved in 2019. So we have an APHIS permit. As the states also have to concur for releases within their states, I have a permit for California and permits are being applied for other states, including all those in which yellow star thistle occurs in the Western USA. 
So if you're interested in the future to get these weevils, I recommend collaborating with Carol Randall, Jennifer Andreas, Joel Price, and Colin Park, and Dan Bean, who will also be involved in multiplying the insect in the future. The life cycle of the insect is that it has one generation per year. Adults emerge in the early spring and they start feeding on the rosette stage, making feeding holes in the leaves and laying eggs in the leaves and the midribs. Here's a split midrib showing what an egg looks like. The eggs hatch in about 10 days and larvae tunnel down the midrib, down into the center of the root where they feed as the plant's growing during the spring. More than one insect can develop inside a plant. Here's a heavily attacked root of a mature rosette. And the larvae pupate inside the plant, and then they emerge as adults through exit holes, usually around ground level, at about the time that the plant is bolting in the spring. So that's usually late May to early June. Adults then feed for about two weeks and then they disappear until the following spring. So there's one generation per year. In May 2019, Massimo Cristoforo and his team went to Greece to collect infested plants to start a new colony because we had stopped research for about 10 years. And he was successful and we got adults into our quarantine lab and we multiplied a generation last fall. And so this is the first time that we've grown them out of season. So we've learned how to produce two generations per year instead of one generation per year. The current system is fairly labor intensive. It involves taking an individual female that's been fertilized, putting her in a small cage on a plant so she can lay eggs in the leaves and then moving her each day to a new plant so we can control the number of larvae per plant. Plants are then held for about uh, a month and a half and then put in bags to collect emerging adults and then we collect the adults and then put them in cold storage until they're ready to be used. Last spring we made our first release in California with cooperators from CDFA and we went back about two months later and found that there were signs of attack although the plants were very small because of the drought in California. Our current research now is focusing on increasing reproduction or production for future releases. Now we currently have a good system for rearing our plants but we'd like to increase the efficiency of that. We're also looking at other ways to um, maximize production. The first is to increase the number of generations per year because normally it's just one generation per year. And we're using cold storage conditions as well as insect hormones to break diapause early so that we can multiply the insects any time of year. Second, we're improving methods to stockpile the adults so that they're ready to release in spring. So if you produce adults, for example, in the fall, then they're held until the spring for release. And lastly, we're working on developing an artificial diet, which would improve the efficiency and decrease the cost of production. And much of this work right now is being done by Ikju Park, who's working as a postdoc in my laboratory. Lastly, what is our distribution plan? Uh, we're working on having a Zoom training this fall for a few groups that are interested to receive the insect and start rearing on potted plants, specifically a team at CDFA in California, the Nez Pierce Insectary in Idaho, and the Palisades Insectary in Colorado. So if you're interested in part participating in the Zoom training in the fall, which will be later in November, go ahead and contact me. Otherwise, our strategy is to try and get these out to the various states so the states can then multiply it on their own and do their own distribution plans. Feel free to contact me for further information. Thank you very much. I'm Dan Bean, Colorado Department of Agriculture and I'm stationed at the Palisade Insectary. You can search Palisade Insectary if you have further questions, reach us there. I'm gonna present a brief update on Canada thistle and Russian knapweed biocontrol, both of them important for the state of Colorado. With Canada thistle, we have a rust fungus called punctiformis and Russian knapweed, we have two gall forming agents. With punctiformis, our agent is a root specific fungus a, a root fungus specific to Canada thistle. It's parasitic, lives underground. The only part of its life cycle that appears above ground is the sexual part. It's best known by workers in the field from the showy appearance of ACO spores in the late spring, early summer. They're the rusty colored spores. They don't actually, they're not 
capable of initiating root infections. You have to wait till later in the season and get teleospores, which are much less showy, difficult to locate. But once you locate them, you can make preparations that can be used to initiate infections, as described by Dana Berner and colleagues in 2013 in the journal Biocontrol. Teleospores are two-celled, distinguishing them from other spore types for this, for this biocontrol agent. Our way of, of obtaining materials and getting it out is to scout sites in mid to late summer, collect leaves that are rich in, in telia and teleospores, dry out all the leaves in, in paper bags, grind in your favorite heavy-duty blender, store the coarse powder for use in the fall, and inoculate rosettes in the fall. <clears throat> the germinating teleospores enter the plant's root systems as mycelial infections, and they may remain there for a number of years before revealing themselves, but they do cause the plants to go down in terms of, of vigor and stem density. We've measured stem density on private locations where we've released spores, and private landowners have allowed us to do this. And we find that at 42 months, we have about a, an average 60% decline in stem densities. One thing that we did notice with this work is that at some sites, we have complete collapse of Canada thistle where stem densities decline uh, by 99 or 100%. So we're really working to figure out what, what factors cause this because that would certainly make it much more efficacious biocontrol agent. Otherwise, it's a typical slow decline. We were encouraged enough by this to develop a multi-state program under support from the BCHIP program, our, from the BCHIP funding. Our program involved production of teleospore bearing materials and shipping it out to 11 different states in the Western US. Five of these states have currently recorded establishment of the fungus and certainly in a number of other states, we expect establishment to occur soon. For this project, Karen Rosen is our Colorado contact and she's working with Carol Randall of the Forest Service. We consider this a good large scale successful redistribution effort. The second program is Russian knapweed. It's also a major weed in, in Colorado. We have two gall forming agents that were developed and tested by CABI. Uh, and we're grateful for that because we didn't really have any agents before the two gall formers. We received agents uh, from our cooperators in the US and established agents in Colorado. Uh, Japiella Ivanakovi in 2011, that's the shoot tip gall midge and Alicidia croptolonica. 2016, that's the, the stem gall wasp. Ivana Covey does well at sites that are relatively wet because they require fresh plant material throughout the season, whereas Acroptolonica can survive over the summer in hardened galls where they die a pause until the next spring. So uh, we were more than happy to see establishment across uh, Colorado of Acroptolonica. And now we've released 200,000 wasps in 2020 and are encouraged by the signs that we could potentially have success with the wasp. Populations of the wasp are building at older release sites. Multiple galls have been found on single plants. So you can go out to some of our release sites and find plants like the one in the lower left corner that have multiple galls and are severely stunted. Both, when both species are present, you get, we would probably expect a bigger impact. We're currently studying that. Plants are stunted, especially at our older release sites. And at one release site where we had uh, good gall numbers in 2019, 378 and 16 meters squared site, it skyrocketed to over 27,000 in 2020. So we expect success. We're seeing decline. And given the nature of Russian napreed and the problems with it, we'd be very happy to see that. Thanks Sonia Daly for this project because she's currently the leader and director of it. And Joel and Jess brought the project along from its beginnings and Carol has been very helpful in getting it, getting our project advertised to multi-state cooperators. I think that's the quick story. Please contact us if you have any further questions about the program. Thank you. My name is Patrick Moran. I'm a research entomologist at the USDA Agricultural Research Service Invasive Plant Species Pollinator Health in Albany, California. I'm going to talk a little bit about Arundo and Cape Ivy biocontrol projects and a new project on ice plant. 
So for Rundo, I worked in the past with Dr. John Goolsby, who's on this call to characterize these two biocontrol agents, the shoot tip galling wasp, Tetramisa romana. We demonstrated over the past five years in some publications that this wasp reduces biomass of Arundo 30 to 44 percent in the original release area in the lower Rio Grande Basin of Texas and Mexico. So I've been releasing it in uh, Northern California. There's also the Arundo armored scale, Rhizospidiotis donassis, and a recent paper that we published suggested that the wasp plus scale together lead to a further reduction of up to an additional 50% of the live biomass in Arundo. So in California, I brought wasps from Texas and released them at a total of 11 sites so far in the Central Valley, focusing on these critical watersheds that feed into the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, essentially the water nexus for California, so Arundo is a major invader in this area. And at nine of the sites that which we released in 2017, about a thousand wasps per site, nine plots per site, we went back and did surveys uh, in 2018, 2019, and 2020. And in the 2019 surveys at two of the nine sites, we found presence of exit holes made by emerging wasp or galls at 50% or more of the survey points. These pictures down here show the most recent surveys in 2020, and the yellow points are survey points which had the wasp, some evidence of the wasp. So the wasp is widespread and dispersing at these sites and we're seeing young main shoots galled in the understory, which is a clear sign of a damaging wasp population. We have baseline biomass data for these sites and we will be monitoring impact. At some of these sites we did not get strong wasp establishment and we already knew from our 2017 studies that if we pre-treat the Arundo plots with either ground cut or mowing at one meter height, we get much higher densities of exit holes than if we just release wasps into plots that were not cut. So at these sites which failed to establish in 2017, we instituted a double cut technique this year. So this is, could be considered integrated control. So we ground cut the plots, allow them to grow back for a couple of months, then mowed them several times. And then by September of this year, we see this clear difference between plots that only got the initial ground cut versus plots that got the topping. Uh, the plots with double cut, much more suitable tissue for the wasp. The wasp likes the side shoots, the lateral shoots. They will attack the main shoots, but in terms of initial establishment, what we're looking for is lots of a, a vigorous arundo with side shoots. So now we've released the wasps into these plots and we're going to evaluate the success um, of this double cut technique. In terms of the Arundo Armored Scale, the way we released this agent in 2017 and 2018 was to infest greenhouse microplants, we called them Arundo, in pots, and then allow one generation, which takes about six months, in the greenhouse, and then we put these potted plants out in the field. And we found so far at seven sites evidence one in two years after the release of reproductive females present at the sites on the resident Arundos. This is good evidence of establishment of the Arundo armored scale. It's not going to disperse nearly as fast as the wasp, but at least we have initial evidence of establishment. We've also started some new studies this year to look at the different kinds of ways of releasing the armored scale in larger numbers and to see if we can get an, a result in terms of impact. But it's going to take several years to see if we actually see a widespread impact. We also have a third agent for Arundo, the uh, leaf miner Lasiopter donassis, that was permitted for release in North America based on the work that John Goolsby and his group did in Texas, but not yet released. The problem is uh, rearing it outside of quarantine. This leaf miner works with this cosmopolitan fungus, which provides a source of food. Uh, there are ways to isolate the leaf miner from its European fungus and also from a nematode that infects it. And we've been working, starting to work with the BBCA to refine the isolation and infestation techniques shipped to our quarantine in Albany and then find a California fungal isolate on a rundo and pair it with a European leaf miner. And that's the plan for the next few years. Cape ivy is another invasive weed in California, mostly along the immediate coast. And we've released the world's first biocontrol agent of Cape ivy, which is also invasive in Australia and uh, New Zealand and Mediterranean Europe. The shoot tip galling uh, to fritted fly We've released it at a, a total of 18 sites along the California coast. This map here shows 10 sites, and we are seeing now evidence of establishment. The releases were started in 2018, and we've, we're now seeing a big increase in the density of galls at several of these sites, total of five sites so far. 
We don't have data on impact yet. We will be monitoring that. And again, for these sites, we do have some baseline data on the uh, standing biomass and, and density of the Cape Ivy. We also have a second agent for uh, Cape Ivy, the leaf mining moth, Digitivalva delaria. This moth can feed on several native Senecio species in quarantine and survive multiple instars on this particular native Senecio. So we're finishing up those tests right now. We're going to submit an addendum to the tag petition to APHIS. We're collaborating with the CSIRO in Australia. We've actually provided them the pupae to, to start their own host range testing program using this moth. And also we're doing genetic studies with CSIRO to determine the invasive origins of Cape Ivy in various parts of the world. The new project I wanted to briefly mention involves ice plant. And this is a collaborative project. Ice plant is an invasive plant along the coast, especially in Southern California and in the Channel Islands, where it's considered a major ecological invader, a damaging invader. There's two species that we're looking at, and uh, both of these plants are native to South Africa and also parts of Mediterranean Europe. So we've established, we've gotten some extramural funding and we've established collaboration with Dr. Ian Patterson, Rhodes University in South Africa, to collect samples and do genetic origin analyses, potential biocontrol agents, and also with the BBCA to collect samples and look at potential biocontrol agents. So that's some of the projects we're working on and thanks for your time. Good to uh, see everybody today. I'm down here in the very southern tip of Texas. Patrick uh, Moran mentioned that we worked for many years together on Arundo Donax. So the work here in Texas on that is concluded and I'm working now on this uh, invasive guinea grass and uh, my collaborators to do the foreign exploration are Massimo Cristofaro at BBCA. And then there's a lot of work that has been done on the genetics of this grass. And I've been working closely with John Gaskin. And you can see the other uh, collaborators there here in Texas and in South Africa. This is a unique grass in that it creates what is called a pathogenic landscape. This grass is so dense and covers all of the habitats in South Texas, urban areas, natural areas, agricultural areas like sugarcane and citrus. But the reason that we're particularly interested in it at USDA is that it creates this environment that's favorable for cattle fever tick invasion. And cattle fever tick is an exotic uh, livestock pest that we keep eradicated from the U.S. and it keeps invading. But what it does is it creates this habitat that reduces ground-dwelling predators like ants so that the tick has no really good natural predator. And then also it, it makes an environment that's much more favorable, much cooler, more humid, which allows for a greater survival of the tick. So what it does is it facilitates the invasion of this tick, which leads to lots of problems for USDA and keeping it eradicated. So it seems like a great target for biocontrol. The other interesting problem with this grass is that there are two different forms, the little and the big form, and they, there is no intergradation between the two. You get one or the other. It's almost as if they are different species. The big form is really common worldwide and in Mexico and throughout the tropics but there's only a small amount of it here in Texas and northeastern Mexico. What we have is this little form that is more drought adapted, the giddy grass. So it is 99.9% .9 of the infestation. So that's the target. We're looking for an agent that will attack only the little guinea grass and not the big guinea grass. So that's a tall order, but anyway, we think we can do it. So we have looked closely at the genetics because we need to find out where our little guinea grass uh, comes from in Africa. And John Gaskin has done a lot of work and found that the best match with South Texas is South Africa around uh, Durban. So we have um, concentrated our, our field research in South Africa, looking at this uh, genetic match site. What we have done is we focused on mites because the mites are known to be highly specific, especially these areophyid mites. And uh, we have two of them in quarantine that we are testing. And what we're doing right now is just looking for something that only attacks the little guinea, not the big guinea. And then of course, we're testing the closest uh, native relatives like switchgrass. 
but it, we think that these both of these uh, agents have a, a good chance of being specific enough. And uh, the, one of the other things that we'll also have to do is determine how damaging they are to the plant. But we really want an agent that is focused on just the invasive form of this guinea grass. So I'll end with uh, this guinea grass is spreading all throughout Texas, even as far north as Houston. It'll probably eventually go across the southeastern U.S. So if any of the land managers that are on this call are interested in learning more about guinea grass, please give me a call. And especially uh, if you're from Florida, because there's a lot of this grass uh, spreading in uh, central Florida. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, everyone. That was a great update. So we are going to move on to the, the Canada update. So we will hand it over to you, Rob. And John. Okay, so I'm opening for Canada here. And what we have in this picture is the program in a slide. Okay, so this is basically all of the, in the center column here, the weeds that are being targeted. And what we're doing, okay, taking it through seven stages, which most of you in biocontrol are going to be very familiar with. And these are the stages uh, that each of these weeds are presently at in the development process. And then the agents are listed here. And then here we have the activities that go with those different stages. So we start with determining whether or not we're going to be able to justify a biocontrol program. Is it really needed? that's really doing economic analysis, the distribution, how big of a problem it is. Once it's determined that there is a need for a program followed by overseas exploration done by colleagues at CABI or BBCA or other organizations. Uh, then we do the biology and host range studies, which is really the safety and impact testing. We do some of that work here, but much of that is also done overseas by colleagues, followed by petitioning for release. And then a lot of our work is really in the field release propagation stage five, six, and seven here, which are field release assessing the establishment and impact and then followed by long-term monitoring and redistribution. And you can see that we have weeds at all of those stages. So this would be the activities associated with those. So narrowing in on the weeds that I'm responsible for, I'm talking first, col colleagues, uh, Rose de Clerc, Flo, Alec McClay, and Chandra Moffat are gonna to speak to the uh, weeds that they're uh, involved in. So to begin with, with flowering rush, John, I was really excited to hear that information that you guys have identified the genotype because we're part of that consortium, interested to know target it, better target it with biocontrol agents. The, the weed is a problem in BC, Alberta, and Ontario. And BC ha has the, one of the, war Un uncommon genotypes, but also has that genotype one. But we're really looking forward to getting that agent. But so far, that's we haven't really done much on it. We're just waiting for the petitioning process. Himalayan balsam, that's one that we're working on with CABI in the UK, looking at the rust pathogen that was released in the UK in 2015, I think it was. The pathogen, unfortunately, is very specific and I say that because it doesn't necessarily affect the genotypes that they have there and we have the same genotypes present in BC that they have in the UK. We're looking at going back with that one and hopefully finding a more genotype from the point of origin and to match it better with the with the genotypes that we have in the field. But again that's still at a stage of doing the host range testing. It's very specific, almost too specific in this case, which is a common Thing with a lot of the pathogens. Then moving on to looking at stage five in terms of field release and propagation, others have already mentioned too that we have relatively recent permitting for uh, common reed. There's the two uh, species, in this case it says Arcanera, one of them has actually been moved into another genus, Linisa, but it's, it's the two species of moths that have been referred to. These have been permitted for release in Canada in 2019 and the first release was done that year in a cage looking at releases of adults and we're really at a question at a stage with both of these of asking questions about how best to get them out. Is it better to release eggs? Is it better to release adults? 
the life cycle of the insect really dictates that and, and we've done, we're in the process of doing testing to see which of those works best. That is with colleagues already mentioned at CABI and group at Cornell and Lisa Tewksbury at University of Rhode Island. So basically all we've done with that so far is, is try a couple of different methods. The insects are definitely not established and we're just getting going with cage releases. Uh, garlic mustard, similar early stage project. We are releasing the weevil, the root crown weevil that Harriet mentioned, Pseudorhynchus scrobicolis. And we have, it was first released in 2018 with colleagues from the University of Minnesota. This is an interesting insect because it has a quiescence basically during the summer, which is a bit strange for a lot of the insects that we work with. And it's not, has a relatively complicated life cycle that Jeannie Katowicz and Roger Becker and others have worked out the methods to rear it. The encouraging news, again, the question is whether we release adults or whether we release attacked plants that contain larvae and eggs. The adult weevils, have to go through a generation of rearing before release because there's a parasitoid that can emerge from adult weevils, at least in the literature, and it has been observed in Europe. We either have to rear them a generation as adults to get a new F1 to release, or else releasing the attack plants that they lay their eggs in. The encouraging news most recently is, is that we're seeing what we think might be feeding damage in the field from some of that early release. It's still uh, not confirmed and we haven't found any adults. So we have a ways to go with it, but it is looking uh, promising. Moving on to the knotweeds, many people have mentioned Aphalera already. We've done releases with it since 2014. And basically we've been able to get establishment and we have been able to get overwintering populations that are found in the spring. And we have been able to get populations where we can detect them all the way through the summer, but we have not been able to get populations that are found continuously at the same site. So it isn't established yet. We're encouraged because we're now working with this new uh, line that was collected in Japan in 2019 by colleagues at CABI, which is hopefully not gone through all the genetic bottlenecks that the lab populations that we have been releasing have gone through. And so that's the one that we're working with to release right now. To date, the, the field data that we have shows that it may prefer older plants or it does better on older plants than it does on younger plants. The concern was is that the populations that were of the previous, that previously were released had been selected in the laboratory for young soft succulent plants by our rearing process. So that when you put them out in the field, you got lots of eggs, but then the nymphs would die because they cannot uh, feed on the tougher knotweed plants. So that's a story that's that still to be continued, but it looks promising. Finally, moving on to stage six, the dog strangling vine project. We have Hypena established at a couple of locations in Ontario. The populations are, are building in terms of spreading out from the original release point, but we're still at a very slow growth point in that we can find them. The defoliation can be quite high. It was very high in 2019, but seemed to go back down again in 2020. There's still an awful, it's, I think that's gonna be a slow process, but we do have the insect established. So I'm now just gonna pass it over. That's the end of the ones that I'm dealing with. And I'm just gonna pass it over to Rose de Klerk Float. Hello, I'm Rose de Klerk Float. I'm at the same research center as uh, Rob with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, working in uh, classical weed biological control. I'll carry on with the projects I'm involved with, again, uh, following the, the seven stages of our uh, programs. And I'll, yeah, I'll just be touching on all of these, but, but Dalma first Dalmatian toad flax, Messinus Peter Harrisi is a new agent that's being tested for host specificity right now by CABI, specifically Ivo Tozovsky, who's in uh, Serbia. And uh, the reason why we're testing this species is that we needed something um, that was more adapted to our colder areas or climates. And uh, this species is found in montane areas of Macedonia and Greece. 
and we think it fits the bill and it's also a very host specific agent. This will complement um, Messinus yantiniformis that was released on Dalmatian toe flax in the early 1990s and has done quite well in the more southern warmer interior climates in British Columbia. Moving on to the hawkweeds at this stage, we have Olicidia pilicilli, which is a leaf galling wasp that forms a small pea sized galls along the midrib of the leaves and on the stems of the plant. It is currently being reared by us in containment. It hasn't been petitioned yet, but post specificity testing is ongoing by CABI in Switzerland. We have in Lethbridge six different populations that we've been rearing since 2012 using materials uh, shipped to us by CABI and these are genetically fall into two different biotypes or different groupings based on their host range and their biology. Chandra Moffat who will be speaking coming up actually did our masters on this species and uh, we're continuing looking at the impact of Olicidia pilicilli on the different invasive pilicilla hawkweed species and it shows uh, I think it shows some promise. Moving on to our petitions, I'm currently involved with two co-petitions with the U.S. One for Acaria, uh, a gall mite, Acaria angustifolia for Russian olive, which is a fairly um, new project for Canada, and uh, also one for uh, Dalmatian toad flax, a Rhinusa uh, rara, which is a, a stem galling weevil. The Russian olive petition was mentioned by Harriet at the very beginning of the meeting and as she mentioned it's in the process of being petitioned and there's some back and forth going on with the review on the Canadian side but uh, I think we're de developing a strong case for its release in Canada so that'll be coming up uh, hopefully in the next few months. Dalmatian toad flax with the Rhinus rara it, it looks like another promising agent and it'll be petitioned together with Charlene Singh this winter. It, but the test so far, or the work that's been done by CABI and specifically Ivo Tazovsky again in Serbia has found that it's very host specific and the galls severely stunt Dalmatian toe flex shoots. Again, it, it may be able to fit into these open areas where we're not getting effective Dalmatian toe flax control. And moving on to field release and propagation. Propagation, so again the hawkweeds, we had an agent Colosia urbana which is a, a root mining hoverfly. I think it was mentioned by uh, Harriet that it's very difficult to rear. We cannot rear through a full generation in the lab so that so thus we have been receiving eggs. It was approved for release in 2017 but we've been receiving eggs from CABI and transferring them to potted plants and, and then rearing them through to the pupil stage, overwintering them in artificial conditions or taking them out in their pots, like with, with their potted plants, and sinking them into the ground in the fall. And that was how we made our first release in British Columbia. We also tried transferring the eggs directly outdoors at release sites onto plants. Here we're targeting orange and meadow hawkweeds and then also we tried releasing adults that emerged from our potted plants in the spring that we took out of cold storage. We're still not 100% sure if we've had establishment, it's really hard to tell, but one of the BC folks did see a black hoverfly that uh, looked a lot like Colosia a couple of springs ago. We're hopeful. We'll keep trying. Next, the hawkweeds for assessment, establishment, and field impact. Olicidia subterminalis was released some time ago in 2011 in uh, British Columbia. We've been targeting whiplash hawkweed, although its main host really is mousy or hawkweed, but whiplash is very closely uh, related, like it derives ancestrally from a hybrid between mouse ear and meadow hawkweed. So that's why the insect, which calls the tips of the stolons, I, I guess it recognizes something in whiplash as a host. Releases were made at a number of sites in the Okanagan area of British Columbia and they've been just sitting there like present but not in high numbers and not increasing until this year some monitoring is showing there's some promise being shown at a couple of the release sites. So we're hoping that it can increase and have impact. 
Well, the yellow toe flax agent is where I've been putting the bulk of my efforts of late, Rhinusa pilosa. It's a stem galling weevil. It forms a, a rather nice, large, fleshy gall on the stems that uh, really sucks up a lot of uh, water and nutrients from yellow toe flax. We've been rearing and learning how to rear it for over 10 years now, first in containment and now just in a, our regular lab space at Lethbridge. And we can get the numbers quite high during the summer rearing. This year we had the rear in our backyard. It just made it easier. So myself and my two technicians managed to get a few thousand reared. But the first releases were made in 2014. It was again a co-petition, this one with uh, Charlene Singh. And we quickly went to field release. We released it in seven provinces from coast to coast. And our following establishment, there seems to be some differentiation in, in the preference of climate types. It seems to be doing quite well and it really is taking off in some, some of our western sites at higher elevations in, in BC and in southern Alberta. And I think it's showing a lot of promise. Next, we're going to be looking at the effects of moisture on the landscape. We think there might be a relationship there with its establishment success and the level of moisture available, especially in the spring when the galls are rapidly forming. We're also looking at the effect of insect genetics. We have different genetic lines that we obtained from Evo Tzatzowski in Serbia, and we're rearing them separately, and we're going to see which genotypes are going to work in our different environments. And finally, long-term monitoring and redistribution for uh, yellow toe flax. This is an old project, Nesianthinus. It was released together unknowingly with uh, Mesnes dianthiniformis in the early 1990s. Turns out that they are cryptic species. You can't tell them apart visually, but genetically you can, or uh, molecularly you can. So we've been going back to our old release sites for Mesnes dianthiniformis on yellow toe flax. Uh, they separate by host too, by the way, the two species, but um, Mesnes dianthiniformis releases made in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Nova Scotia in the early 1990s in early 2000s have been revisited. Alec McClay helped on these as well. And we got some patterns. It doesn't do well in the more northern uh, reaches of our country, but it certainly has established and is, it's showing some promise at some of the southern release sites in Canada. I'm Alec McClay. I'm an independent uh, consultant in biological control and I've been uh, coordinating a couple of these projects uh, for the last number of years on, on common tansy and oxide daisy. These are both uh, joint uh, US-Canadian projects and the work on the agents is being done by CABI and Sonia Stutz has been uh, doing the testing on, on these agents in recent years. Common tansy, this has been quite a long haul. The project was started back in 2006 and what has slowed us down is that there is Although common tansy is quite well isolated taxonomically from most North American native species, there is one or a couple of native Tanacetum species, one or a couple depending on which botanists you follow, and quite a lot of our agents have accepted these native Tanacetum species uh, fairly readily and have had to be thrown out because of that. We do now have a uh, stem boring weevil, Microplantus millifolii, which is looking quite promising. In open field choice tests, it appears to show a lot very much lower level of attack on the native tansies than it does on common tansy. This work is being done in collaboration with the, the Russian Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg because it's proved to be difficult to transport the insects to uh, Switzerland and rear them there. So it, it's mostly being done in St. Petersburg. Testing is very close to complete on this one. As I say, it looks to have a promising level of specificity and measurable impact on common tansy. Hopefully within a year or so, we should be able to start drafting the petition on this one. Oxide Daisy, I should mention these are both joint US-Canadian projects. Funding has been coming from uh, Minnesota in the early days for Common Tansy, also from uh, Saskatchewan, BC, Montana, and some federal Canadian programs and some smaller funders. On Oxide Daisy, we are looking at a, a root galling fly of nebulosa, which is still in the screening process, looking hopeful so far. Also on Oxide Daisy, there's a root mining moth, Dicloramtha eritana. I should mention what the, the, the critical non-target we have to keep in mind for Oxide Daisy is not a, a native plant. There are no native Leucanthemum species, but it's the cultivated Shasta Daisy, which is a very popular ornamental 
and is a hybrid of several different Lycanthemum species. That's the one that we have to be watching out for. The moth, the Dacarantha eritana, shows very low levels of attack and performance on Shasta daisy, and otherwise seems to be very specific to Oxide daisy. The petition for this one is in the final stages of drafting, and hopefully we should be submitting this uh, for consideration this winter. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say on those, so I will hand over now to Chandra for her part. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, based in British Columbia, and I'll be presenting some work that myself and my colleague, Dr. Dave Ensing, have been working on. So the majority of our work here in BC focuses on long-term monitoring and redistribution, or as we like to call it, contemporary ecology of historical biological control programs. We've also recently started working on uh, stage one, which is weed impact and biocontrol feasibility. So Dave, in collaboration with Philip Wheel at CABI, they're working on parrot's feather. And so Dave's work is reviewing the Canadian distribution and focusing on some niche modeling to examine the feasibility of development of biocontrol for parrot's feather here in BC. So there's uh, quite a number of agents or two agents available potentially, a leaf feeding beetle and a stem mining weevil. And those have been used for biocontrol of parrot's feather in other regions. And so assessing if either of these two agents will be suitable for biocontrol of parrot's feather here in Western North America, or if further agents would be required. We're also in the early stages of examining the feasibility of biocontrol for Tree of Heaven here in the Pacific Northwest. Being with Agriculture Canada, Tree of Heaven in particular is not only known for its impacts, but also as a focal and preferred host plant of the highly invasive brownworm rooted stink bug, which has impacts here in the Okanagan as well as, of course, in other regions of North America and the world. So BBCA is leading the work on development of biocontrol of Tree of Heaven, and right now we're in early stages of developing a test plant list for Western North America. So our work really focuses, like I mentioned, on the long-term monitoring and redistribution. And so we have a large project funded by the BC Ministry of Forests and Range in collaboration with Rose and Rob at Lethbridge, where we're reevaluating the establishment and efficacy um, of several agents released against spotted knapweed in British Columbia. So our work over the last couple of years has taken us to around 25 field sites across southern British Columbia, where we're conducting long-term monitoring. We're going to sites where there has been long-term monitoring and collecting new data to look at the impacts of biological control on spotted knapweed across landscapes in British Columbia. So this work has us collecting many different knapweed individuals from each population, looking at the impact and distribution of different biocontrol agents and the overall um, population impacts these agents have on knapweeds across southern BC. We also are just beginning work to conduct a similar project for St. John's wort. So St. John's wort is a, a weed that has been under biological control, of course, for a number of decades since the 1950s in Western North America, and biocontrol has been very successful. We do see populations of St. John's wort like this one that can have a very high density and broad distribution. So this site alone is more than 15 hectares. So we're beginning the process to reevaluate the efficacy of biological control of, of St. John's wort here in BC in collaboration with partners in the US at CABI to determine if biocontrol, the agents that have been released are still effective, look at some climatic variables, to see if the agents or the weeds are changing their behavior under changing climates or to better understand why St. John's wort is becoming uh, more prolific at high elevations. So of course this work is highly collaborative in nature. A lot of our funding comes from the British Columbia Ministry of Forests and Range. We work very closely with our colleague Peter Mason in Ottawa, his technicians in the quarantine facility, Alec, and in the picture here members of the BC Ministry of Forest Range, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and in blue there in the middle is a PhD student, Kaylee Nielsen, who's working on using biological control systems um, in a number of ways, focusing on spotted knapweed and also uh, knotweeds. So that's all I had to share. Thank you. So I've, I've been asked to give a brief update on biocontrol monitoring, specifically the standardized impact monitoring protocol. <clears throat> this is, a, I've given derivatives of this speech numerous times, but it's an integral part and Chandra gave me a great segue to get going on this. So what I'm gonna talk about very briefly because we only have a few minutes here is the standardized impact monitoring protocol. What we're trying to do is compare apples to apples. We're trying to bring SIMP, the, the protocol I'm talking about into the 21st century. 
And the folks that kind of put this together wanted me to talk about the app for that and then potential uses and analyses that we can get from the SIMP process. And I've heard a couple of people mention it so far today, and it's something that's been widely applicable for a variety of users. And this can be done with both research and site-specific information to help guide uh, land managers. And then lastly, future uses for SIMP and what we can use this protocol for going forward. So who came up with it? I was charged when I came onto the BLM in this capacity back in 2005 with finding holes in biocontrol and how we're using it within the U.S. And in 2006, I came together after a field season under my belt with a group of folks and we figured out that really figuring out what was going on with biocontrol was the big issue. And so we came up with the, this whole protocol. And what we decided to do was make it simple. <laughs> the acronym SIMP just came as a result of that, but it's a user-friendly protocol. It has educational two-page leaflets. It's designed to be a simple monitoring form, citizen science friendly. We wanted it to be the lowest common denominator is kids or kid groups, and that's what we achieved. It was originally designed to take 45 minutes one time per year. Ideally, with biocontrol, you have dedicated folks that go out there and look at it and actually do the monitoring and run through all that. But with biocontrol in general, monitoring always tends to fall on the back burner and it's the lowest common denominator. So we wanted to make this something that somebody could do on their way back from another location or things like that. We put together some trainings and workshops and then we we're off to the races. But the thing that we found as we progressed through the years was the biggest impediment to actually getting some good solid data was the monitoring form itself. Inevitably, it ended up in you know, somebody's drawer somewhere or something like that, and we never got it. And also, as this thing started to progress, it started to snowball a little bit in, in that process. It was pretty cumbersome to put these monitoring forms in manually. So we decided to come up with another way, and this is that way. We came up with an app, and when I say we, we had a consulting firm, MIA Consulting with Becca Winston, put this thing together on the fly. And it was designed to go on your iPhone or your Android device or whatever. And it was designed to be very easy to use. And it took a bunch of the required monitoring data that we might need. It took it automatically. So it wasn't necessary for the folks that were taking the data to actually uh, put those data in themselves. It was automatically generated. What does it look like? Um, this is the interface. It is very sleek, very simple. And I just took some screenshots today to show you guys what it looks like. That's my house. If you guys want to stop by, I can give you a rundown. Um, but it has some basic information and it answers a lot of the stuff for you. And then you get into the um, specifics for the veg on site. And we're not asking folks to really know necessarily what plants they're looking at, what grasses they're looking at down to the species level. What we're asking them to be able to do is differentiate. So that looks like this. So we've got target weed, we've got other weed, we've got corb shrub, perennial grass, bare ground, all the way down through here. And then it adds it up right here. And as you can see, it must add up to 100% or it gives you an error message. This keeps folks honest and it also allows us to make sure that all the data points that we need to have entered are indeed entered. So throughout that process, we get a really good indication of what those sites look like as far as vegetation is concerned. And then we've got the biocontrol specific information, which is really the crux of a biocontrol program. And that looks at insect counts, whether they be 10 sweeps or six time counts. We also have another version of this for cut stems or dug up roots or things like that. And then you put that information in here and over time, you start to get a pretty good picture of what's going on in your respective site. So where is this happening? We've got currently uh, these eight systems that we have formal SIMP processes in place for, and then we've got pre-release for these four down here. We began in 2006 with 80 sites, and in 2019, I haven't looked at all of the 20 data yet because it's still coming in with Canada Thistle, but you can see we've got a lot of sites to look at. And this is blown up a little bit, and I know some folks are using these data and actually having them be private, so this map actually looks a little bit more filled in. But in Idaho, we're using it almost extensively for monitoring, especially these eight systems right here. So what are we doing with the data? Because the other big argument we, we hear is I'll collect the data, but then it just goes in a black hole. And when that happens, it doesn't really benefit anybody. What we're doing with the data is providing it to anybody who wants it. It provides evidence of biocontrol impact, both long-term and varying by scale, whether that be local or regional. We can also look at other environmental factors like plant community, composition, precipitation, elevation, and see what process or what factors are actually affecting the weed. And then what other factors influence weed dynamics? Is impact locally variable? 
Are changes desirable? And this is the big one when it comes to land managers. We always see that ideal biocontrol results graph and you see that damage threshold and if it's below that, we can walk away. But if it's above that, then the changes are not yet desirable. And the idea is to enhance integrated weed management and improve the understanding of biocontrol and really whether or not it's working and adapt release strategies and control measures accordingly so that we can achieve desired results. So what does that look like going forward? We have put together a much more powerful website. And I say much more powerful website, knowing that some of you folks have probably ever knew, never even seen the original website. But we're looking at ways to compare multiple sites. The ability to combine sites for comparison, whether it be watershed level or geographical boundaries, we can actually look and compare, not just with pictures before and after, but also with hard data. We can select different years. The power of the data, obviously, with a 45 minute time um, commitment, isn't in what's collected in let's say 2020, but it is in what's been collected from 2007 to 2020 in those 14 years of data that we can actually go back and pour through and run some uh, numbers on that are all built into the website now. And then we wanted to be able to develop and integrate help videos. And that's never been more important than times like this when we can't really get together for training for obvious reasons. We've also put together some QR codes to link sites that with built-in GPS directions. And this is really nice if you're handing your program over to somebody else and you want to ensure the continuity of the monitoring that's already taken place. And then we wanted to give the, uh, folks the ability to download the database on their own so they could tease out the data, whether that be an arc map or some other way that they want to look at the data themselves, they can do that. And SIMP has now been folded into iBioControl.org. And I know Chuck's going to talk about this here in a second. And it's having it embedded in that means we now have a clearinghouse for all things biocontrol, which also includes the monitoring information that you guys are taking. Ideally, we also want to apply the pre-release data to the new systems to, to assess impact. And we can use these data for a cost-benefit analysis to really help us be able to fund biocontrol going forward because uh, the cost-benefit analysis that's been done with accurately taken data shows that for every dollar you spent with biocontrol, you get thousands on the return, and that just continues to build year after year as you maintain control. And we just want to go beyond before and after pictures. And with the brief amount of time that I have, that's all that I have. I do want to acknowledge some of the cooperators that I've had throughout this whole process. And with that, I will stop sharing and hand it over to Chuck. So I'm going to follow up Joey and talk about the iBioControl.org website and where we are and where we're going with it. So if you haven't been to the website recently, the website was just redone in the last few months and it is a lot more modern than it has been before and it integrates a, a bunch of different tools including some that we're continuing to build. So the URL is iBioControl.org and I'm just going to go through and show you and highlight a few of the features of the website. First of all, there's a new section that is getting started with biocontrol and it goes through what classical biological control of weeds is as well as how to implement a biocontrol program, where to get agents from, how to release agents. And then you move into the SIMP data reporting. You can go in, it has a map of where the SIMP data is located. It has some of the video help guides and videos that have been developed, as well as a QR code to download the app through the Survey123 platform. Another thing that is really one of, one of the most powerful tools on our biocontrol is the biological control catalog. So the catalog that was a couple of publications that were done back in the 80s and then have been updated um, more recently is completely database and completely available through the iBioControl website. So you can go in, search for an agent, search for a weed, and then view all the information related to that release in that country at, at that point in time. And, and I, this has been updated so you can, you know, quickly to filter the results and get exactly what you're looking for as quick as possible. You can also download the publication as well as an Excel spreadsheet of the, the data. And then here's what, once you go to one of the releases, what it looks like, all the information that's available. Moving on to some of the other sections and all of this is powered by the EdMaps and Bugwood Image Database System. You can go in look at different agents, view pictures of that agents. They're going to be converting the fact sheets and having those available for these agents as well. So when you go to it, 
you will have full information about the agent as well as the pictures that are available of, the, of that agent. And you can do similar for the host plants that are focused on the site where you can go in, view resources for the agent, view pictures from the Bugwood image database of the agent, as well as the EdMaps distribution map and other information. The next section is a combination of those two. So it's the agent released on a particular host plant and what the distribution at a county level of that looks like. And we're continue to, continuing to pull data um, from as many sources as we can get to fill in this information of where the known releases, known occurrences of the agents have been found. So then there's a section on apps. Joey talked about the SIMP app. There's also the iBioControl app. And I'm gonna talk about it in a second, but we're gonna be integrating biocontrol releases, biocontrol uh, and biocontrol observations into the main EdMaps and EdMaps Pro apps. So right now there's links to quickly download the SIMP app, the, the biocontrol app, as well as the EdMaps Pro app. We'll be adding the EdMaps app to this. And if you're not familiar, we're in the process of taking all the EdMaps regional apps and combining them into a single EdMaps app that will have all the field guides. You'll go in, you'll choose the, the state that you're in, and then it will download the species. You also can report anything through a search interface through the new app. And, and this app is, is available for both iPhone and Android in the stores now. And, we're gonna slowly make that migration from the regional apps into the, the Core EdMaps app. iBioControl also has a large amount of publications. Any publication that we can link through it is available um, both through the publications tab as well as through the iBioControl vault. This is a database of a whole lot of publications that you can go through, do some searches and pull up the different publications. And we're gonna to continue to grow this and increase the searchability and power of that. Something else that's on the site is the proceedings of the International Symposia on Biological Control of Weeds. All of the proceedings back to 1969 are all available on the site and they have been indexed up to the last few by agent, by host target, and by lead author. And so as you can see in the picture, they have been scanned, all the old proceedings were scanned a few years ago and all the PDFs of all those scans are made available on the website. There's also links to the biological control in your backyard project that Carla Hoops is working on. And with that, I just wanted to thank the different partners, especially the Forest Service and MIA Consulting who have helped to fund and, and develop this site as well as thanking my group at the university. What's coming next, I mentioned already, the EdMaps and EdMaps Pro smartphone apps are gonna incorporate biocontrol reporting. We're not gonna do the SIMP protocol at this point. We're just gonna focus on releases and, and observations in the field and maybe even collections. There's a couple of different ways to report the data. We're also going to be updating the iBioControl website to include an expert database so there will be a resource there where you can go and search. You go in, build your profile for the folks involved on this today. Build your profile of what species you're working on or have worked on and be able to search for people and, and find collaborators that way. Um, also going to include project fact sheets for projects that have been funded through the Forest Service um, BCHIP program and, and try to continue to increase the number of pictures of biological control agents available through the Bugwood Image System and thus through the eyeball control website. So I want to thank my team with the university for making all this possible and thanks for including me on this and there's the website address and my email address if you have any questions. And with that we can go on to Carol. Hi everyone, my name is Carol Randall. I'm with the U.S. Forest Service, I'm a weed biocontrol specialist and I work with five Western states helping folks on the ground to um, implement biological control programs. And to end things off, what we wanted to talk about was how can we create a more cohesive biocontrol community? And one of the first things I wanted to talk about was 
a good way to create cohesion is to actually know who's doing what in classical weevil control. And when I started working with my collaborators in the West, a lot of the folks I worked with at the state level were like, hey, we've got these weeds. We really want to facilitate developing biocontrol programs. Can you get us information on who we should be talking to? And my familiarity with how weed biocontrol programs got developed was in the West, a lot of times we have consortia, which are basically just groups that form and raise funds to send off for foreign exploration for a specific target weed. And so I started putting together just this list of consortia. And when I started out, I really only had 12 consortia that I was familiar with, but then I started reaching out to others I knew in the biocontrol community and asked for edits and inputs. And my list of consortia soon morphed into a much more comprehensive list of classical weed biocontrol research programs. And once I compiled everything, it actually became the North American Weed Classical Biocontrol Research and Development Program Directory and Contacts. It's one of the resources that is available on the iBioControl.org website that Chuck just visited with us about. The first version came out in February of 2018 and documented 50 target weeds with ongoing biocontrol research and development programs. And of those, I still only had 12 consortia. So biocontrol research is happening in a lot of different ways. And I think it's helpful for everybody who's interested in biocontrol just to get familiar with who's doing what. So one of the ways that we can facilitate cohesion is by keeping up a resource that talks about who's doing what. And a lot of the work that Chuck's talking about doing through the iBioControl website and, you know, kind of maintaining these networks is going to be key to that. I am working on an update to the directory. It's collateral duties for me, so I keep having the best of intentions of getting it done. I'm still hoping to get it done by spring 2020, but I like the idea that we're starting to come up with these other opportunities um, to share information and just keep in contact. So another way to create cohesion is um, through professional coordination and communication. And I'm going to talk here specifically about what we're doing in the West, which is a number of our states in the Western U.S. have identified biocontrol coordinators. Oftentimes they're associated with the State Department of Agriculture, sometimes not. But as states identified individuals who could be a state contact for weed biocontrol efforts, we had an opportunity to do some more coordination. And so what we started to do was pull together, actually start scheduling conference calls so that these state biocontrol coordinators could communicate between the states and share information, talk about collection days and redistribution efforts, and just facilitate the flow of biocontrol agents and ensuring that all the proper permits were in place between the states. And as we continue to do this scheduled and coordinated communication efforts, we really started seeing that technology transfer was happening much more rapidly. All of a sudden, we were able to have access to a lot more biocontrol agents as we started accessing collections that were going on in neighboring states. And then the other thing is as we were having these conversations, we were able to start doing some regional planning and actually start coming up with topics that we wanted to discuss at a national level, working with groups like NASMA. In the West, we do this with quarterly conference calls, and then we take very detailed minutes of the conference calls, and then we make those minutes available to anybody who's interested in it. And the way that we've been able to keep that going is there is one person who is committed to ensuring that we schedule a call every three months and that the minutes are taken and routed, and it's really worked well for us. Nationally, we can do this through regularly scheduled summits like the one that we are just concluding, which the NASMA Biocontrol Subcommittee went ahead and organized for us. So I think that this, just doing these summits on a regular basis might be one good way that we can increase cohesion as a biocontrol community. Another way to create cohesion is having all of us in biocontrol using similar methods doing some crowdsourcing and data sharing. And Joey talked about our shared vegetation and weed biocontrol agent monitoring protocol, SIMP. Chuck's been talking about biocontrol and some of the tools that we have available now on the web and with these apps. Once we have these 
methods that kind of go across jurisdictional boundaries. And once we have these applications or online platforms where we can be sharing our data, all of a sudden the jurisdictional boundaries disappear and we as biocontrol enthusiasts have an opportunity to really work and, and do much more interesting collaborative work. And in the West, as a group, most of the states that I work with have been working with Chuck Barjan and EDSMAPS for years. And then as Joey has gotten on board and got the Survey123 app and running for SIP, they've been using those. As a group, Chuck has been really good about developing online training. And we also have our biocontrol specialists, our state contacts, and those of us who work for federal agencies, we are really focusing on training the trainers. And so by being able to transfer fairly straightforward monitoring protocols to land managers who can then pass it on to other folks, we're really able to you know, increase the cadre of folks out there that are doing monitoring and are doing mapping. With the data and online databases, we can easily share that data with our partners and with researchers. And we're really excited by some of the things that we're finding and we're really making some rapid progress in some of these things. Another way that we can really help our biocontrol community is by creating advocacy, by engaging with kind of those larger groups, the weed groups and the invasive species groups. And we as weed biocontrol folks, if we can reach out and start engaging with some of these invasive species groups like NASMA and start addressing some of their needs. We have an opportunity to recruit these folks who are, have a demonstrated concern with invasive plants or invasive species. We can recruit them as weed biocontrol advocates. And in the West, we have cooperative weed management areas. I know that on the East Coast, there are PRISMs, our Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management. The more that we have an opportunity to engage with these folks and just let them know what's going on with biocontrol and sharing information with them, teaching them how to monitor, the better off we are because they're familiar with what we do and they're more likely to advocate for us. Another thing that we've really been successful with here in the West is there are a number of us who work in biocontrol who work with state weed control associations. In the West, we have a Western Weed Coordination Committee and those folks are generous enough to let us come in and give them biocontrol updates on a pretty annual basis. And then again, NASMA is sponsoring this summit. And there's also a federal interagency committee for the management of noxious and exotic weeds that we'll engage with. Again, just keeping us on the radar for folks who are engaged with weed management and might not think of biocontrol right off the bat. Another thing about engaging these local groups and these folks who are land managers is that when there's a need for a new or improved biocontrol program, if we can be engaging these land managers to be vocalizing the need for additional biocontrols, that's going to help us, especially if they're consistent in the request to their legislators to make sure that support for biocontrol research and development is happening at the state level as well as at the federal level. And then really weed biocontrol's best hope moving forward was to continue to focus on coordinating between biocontrol folks and with our clients, the land managers on the ground, and making sure that by communicating with each other and communicating with those who are in a position to help us financially or just for the support that we need to get through some of these processes. I think that's the best way that we can support ourselves and come up with a cohesive biocontrol community. And so with that, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Carol. And thank you for everyone in that session. We have reached the end of our summit. I think it was um, pretty successful. We had a lot of people here. I think it topped out at 430 attendees. So that's pretty phenomenal. I'm both Carrie and I are going to have a few things to say, but I wanted to thank all of our speakers for making time to share your interesting work. And also thank you for keeping on time. I know it's really hard to talk about all you do in five minutes. Thank you again to the Bureau of Land Management and Wyoming Weed and Pest Council for sponsoring the summit and to the NIAE staff for running it so smoothly. Finally, thank you to all the participants for your interest. This summit has been recorded and will be available on NIAE's YouTube channel, I think that's what you would call it, for later viewing. If you aren't already a member, please join NIESMA. And if you're interested, you're also welcome to join our biocontrol uh, committee. 
I did want to mention really quickly the poll results. We had a variable distribution, so most people came from the Western U.S., but we did have representation from pretty much everywhere. We asked how is weed biocontrol related to your work, and 47% indicated that biocontrol is being part, used as part of their invasive species management work. And I think what's interesting for us as biocontrol researchers and practitioners is that 31% said that they aren't using it, but they would like to learn more. So that demonstrates to me that we have an opportunity to grow our partnerships. And then finally, we asked why people were attending and we gave people the option to respond to a variety of different things so that they didn't have to choose just one. And we looked at, the biggest thing was 55% said they just wanted to learn more about weed biocontrol in general. But we see some variability on all of this. So it seems to me we're reaching new audiences as well. I'll just wrap up my section and then Carrie can jump in. We are seeking, as for the biocontrol committee and Naisma to grow and strengthen the biocontrol committee and the community. Thanks, Jen. And I just wanted to second Jen's thanks to everybody who made this possible and to all the participants for sticking with us for a long day with few breaks. It was really great to learn more about everybody's program. And I also just wanted to remind any presenters who are still on the line, there are some open questions in the Q&A chat box. So if you could take a look in there uh, and see if there's any questions directed towards you and respond to them, that would be great. And it's been a really great day, so thank you all.